Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the August 22nd, 2018 Select Board meeting. I'll call this meeting to order. And we have a consent agenda, which consists of warrants AP 857, AP 1858, AP 1858-2, AP 1905, AP 1906, AP 1906, Dash S, AP 1907, AP 1907 2, PR 1854, PR 1904, PR 1905, and PR 1906. We have a one day liquor license that we're holding off on right now until some other things um, are settled, which were the first. So that's off the agenda right now. Um, it will come back to us the first meeting we have in September. Uh, we have a municipal officer contract to sign with the city of Northampton. This is something that we've done on a yearly basis, as well as the sealer of weights and measures uh, with the city of Northampton. We have a memorandum of understanding, um, and I was hoping that have, we don't need to have them, but the, it's for the PD department. Um, we actually do have that. We do have that? No. No, I know I have it. I'm just saying I There's no I don't need to elaborate on it right, right now. Right, right. Um, and I will hold off on the dispatch appointment until the chief shows up. I'm surprised he's not here yet. Um, we have uh, signatures for the mutual aid ambulance agreement and for the uh, paramedic intercept agreement with the town of Amherst. We have finally received those, so thank you to Amherst for sending those along. Um, so would you want to take a vote on that? Let's I move, um, I'll move to approve uh, the items, you know, except for the two that were pulled out. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, well, look who's here, Joyce. Look who's here. I just said I'm surprised he's not here yet. And here they are. Fabulous. Um, we have the appointment of a temporary full-time dispatcher of Elizabeth Nagella. Hi. Hello. And I'll let uh, Chief Mason take over on that. So uh, just really quickly, I'm sure all of you recognize Elizabeth. Uh, I just have a quick bio here. Uh, I've kept the board informed um, that we do have a, one of our full-time dispatchers is out uh, with some medical issues right now, um, and it's going to be out for a significant period of time. So uh, we would like to bring on a temporary full-time person because it's just more efficient that way. We don't have to backfill with overtime and part-timers and things like that. So Elizabeth uh, has been working for us since 2015. Uh, first as a civilian cell attendant, and then shortly after that she became a part-time dispatcher for us. She comes from a family of public service, with both of her parents working for Hadley Public Schools. Uh, she has been a lifelong Hadley resident and graduated from Hadley Schools. Prior to her uh, employment for the town of Hadley, she had completed both the Northampton Police Explorers Program as well as the Massachusetts State Police Student Trooper Program. Uh, since her employment began with us, she has been uh, an extremely dedicated employee coming in any time we need her. Uh, she's an excellent dispatcher and is well regarded by her co-workers and her supervisors. Most recently, um, since our dispatcher vacated the post, she has taken most of the uh, midnight shifts working full-time hours almost every week. So with all of this information, um, I would like to request that she be appointed as a full-time dispatcher for us and then we will uh, re-examine this issue once we have a little bit more information on uh, what's going to happen with our staffing. Motion to approve. I'll second. second. And I just have to say that I'm sure that Chief Huckwoods is smiling now. <laughs> yeah. Very, <humbling. laughs> very, very appreciative of your role that you're playing in our department. Thank you. You're welcome. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, did, yeah. Yeah. Lieutenant Cook, did you want to quickly step in for a second and do your... I would love to. 
uh, yeah. truck. Yeah. I would like you yeah. to just take that, the Route 9 speed limits and signs, if you want to do that, that would be fine, and you can. Okay. Thank you so much. Just to give a brief overview on this, Mitch won't take more than five minutes of your time. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the first things that we had Mitch kind of start doing is, is um, examine uh, a lot of the issues we have with speed around town. We get a lot of speeding complaints and we really try to attack them as best we can. Uh, one of the ones that we get quite often is Route 9. With the crosswalks, especially here in the center of town, the new uh, crosswalk going in down the street. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about speed and the way that the speed limits are set up on Route 9 for the last many years is, what's the word? Crazy. Crazy. Yeah, uh, it changes five times within from coming off the bridge all the way into Amherst. Uh, so what we what Mitch did is he started putting together a plan. We brought David Nixon in and Marlo um, to help us out with some of the the mass highway laws and signage and things like that. And he put together just a really quick presentation for you. And there's a, hopefully a letter that we would be able to induce you to sign so that we can send to. DOT and uh, make the requests to make some of these changes. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jennifer, for putting that together and getting it to the board. I'm just going to pass out really quickly. Chief Mason really hit on all the high points. But uh, the, what I'm passing out to you is just some uh, snips of Route 9 via Google Maps. And basically, it just portrays the speed limit down Route 9. When you come over the bridge into Hadley, it's a 40 mile per hour zone, drops to 35 by S1, picks it back up by the Farm Museum, picks back up at Mill Valley Road, drops back down by the malls, and over less than five miles it changes five times. So 35 miles per hour, 35 miles per hour is by the malls, 35 miles per hour here in the center of town. I feel as though 35 makes the most sense to be across Route 9 from end to end. It would make it easy for easier for folks to know what the speed limit is. It would be easier for our officers to enforce. If it's on Route 9, it's 35. Um, so that is fairly straightforward. And on Route 9, the roadway signs for the speed limit are similar to what you see on our town roads. They're 18 by 24. The manual, the manual that covers traffic control devices for multi-lane roads indicates that it should be a 30 by 36, something along those lines, but bigger than what we have, similar, similar to what you'd see like on Route 33 in Chicopee. Would you say that sign size was? Uh, most of them on Route 9 are, some of them are 18 by 24, but mostly 24 by 30, but it sounds big, but when you're driving down Route 9, they look very tiny. Um, and I'm guessing by the pictures, I'm pretty sure by looking in the manual, the ones you saw on Route 33 were around 30 by 36. And, and they do have, they do make a 40 by 60, but I'm pretty sure those were. Those are like the turnpike in 91, yeah, correct? Yeah, it goes to a dual, a dual post, wider sign, so it does pop much more, so. So uh, as part of the letter that I would ask you to sign, instead of Mass DOT, we would ask that they increase all of the signs uh, the size of the speed limit signs. And then, uh, aside from the speed limit signs, as everyone knows, they have the new advanced warning system for the pedestrian crossing here by the courthouse. And one of the concerns is the West Street curve. With some of the speeds on Route 9, 60, 70, 80 miles per hour. And if you're coming around the curve by West Street, not you, but if, <laughs> if, if, if a motorist is coming down Route 9 doing 60, 70, 80 miles per hour, and all of a sudden that pedestrian crossing is red, then that's gonna be problematic. So as everyone has seen, when you see blind spots where there are traffic lights, oftentimes you see in advance, there's a red traffic signal ahead sign flashing yellow or whatever to tell you, hey, there's a red light coming up ahead. And I think that that would be imperative the safety of the, not only the, the folks crossing Route 9, but also to the motorists. We all know the Route 9 is backed up on a regular basis, so just taking into account the distance from the curve to the crosswalk, but consider if you have a, a line of 30 cars that are stopped, then you have that much less distance from the curve itself. 
to where traffic stopped. So I think it's imperative to the safety of the pedestrians and the motors to have that advance warning signal. And that's everything I have. I saw our finest at the uh, bridge area this evening as I was coming home from work. I wasn't going 40, I was going good. <laughs> tonight, tonight I was. That's where it is. No, I didn't go off every day. I think certainly, I think we've all uh, had our thoughts on Route 9 and the amount of traffic that we have. And it's certainly in the next week, is certainly going to get busier. Uh, and people do think of it as, and I've said it before, as the Indy 500 when they come over the bridge and they're just heading this way and they just don't stop and think what they're doing. And we've had several serious accidents there by Echelon um, around that corner and people trying to get across the road. They don't use our intersection here. They try to get across there at West Street or come out on West Street onto there. And um, there's been some serious accidents there. There have quite a few. So I'm in favor of this. Certainly. Great idea. I got a, something similar. Um, the grant money that we got for the added enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, any luck? Any uh, great stops as a result of that? Or anything you can share as far as how that's working out? And right now we have two enforcement periods going on, which are uh, drunk driving enforcement and distracted driving enforcement. So really what the officers are out looking for is, is they're looking for they're looking for folks that are on their cell phones, texting or scrolling on Facebook or whatever the case may be. And then the other one we're looking for is impaired driving. So really what that one's more focused in a, in a PM time frame. Obviously that's gonna be the time where we're gonna interact more with more uh, intoxicated drivers. So what we're really out looking for is we're looking for cars that are weaving and, and, um, and uh, driving under man other manners that indicate impairment. So speed is, obviously, if someone's driving down the road doing 65 or 70 miles an hour, we're not going to ignore it because they're not swerving all over the road. But speed isn't really the main enforcement right now. Um, but even just this year, I've stopped cars in the 70 to 80 mile per hour range on Route 9. And uh, I mean, it's, it's surprising at the time. But looking back on it, for the amount of cars that I've stopped doing that speed, it's not surprising. I think we, people we, are just not paying attention to what they're doing. I just coming here this evening, I had somebody pass me on Bay Road before Moody Bridge Road, so right in that stretch with an oncoming car coming. Mm -hmm. And they cut me off. I mean, I had to break. She has a picture. I have a picture. <laughs> of car, but anyway. I used to be able to, used to be able to write a ticket yeah. like that. Can't do that anymore. No. But we we uh, we have been just to expand upon that. We we have, we have obviously have to track citations for the grant. Periods, but um, I've Mitch and I have actually been tracking citations for a little bit longer than that, trying to get the numbers up a little bit, and we definitely are getting uh, a big increase uh, in in uh, stops and citations issued just because of a lot of the. I mean, we get a lot of complaints that so people call all the time about speeders on their street. Yeah. We just try to bounce people around as much as we can, and uh, they're working the ramp pretty good. So I keep getting asked by this gentleman. And I think I've mentioned it to you before on Rocky Hill Road there. I don't know if there's anything where it changes from 20 on one side to 40 on the other side mm -hmm. when you go through the Rocky Hill intersection by the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can take a look at that. It's kind of a dangerous change in numbers one way to the other. I think Marlo and I actually were emailing that gentleman back and forth uh, a little while ago. I'm not going to call exactly what. Murkowski? Yeah. Okay. And we're all what we ended up as, but we can we can re-examine that. Okay, thank you. I think that would have been one of the signs was missing. Yes, that's right. Um, one of the signs was missing. We got to put that back, back up. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, on the same basis as Route Nine changes speed limits always, so does Rocky Hill. Are you looking at making that uniform? Uh, that's something we can obviously consider. I think we have the folks right here that uh, would be able to, to enact that. I, I believe the speed limits are governed by town bylaw. Um, is it Rocky Hill 35 anyway? No. Rocky like Hill changes. 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 Yeah. changes going over the hill to 40. It's 30. 35, 30, 40. Okay. It's three, three or four different speed limits. So certainly we should unify it to one speed limit too. 
the residential area. Yeah, I think there that I've gotten complaints too along there. People about drive, just people driving too fast and people having issue even getting their trash picked up because yeah. of the speed on that. Well, so it's, it's, it's a well traveled yeah. road. I mean, it's the alternate to Route Nine. I mean, we all know that. Yeah. So yeah. just have to. So I think you have the support of the board to do whatever you need to do. Yeah. So we did take a vote. All in favor? Yes, that was a yes. Yes. And yeah. we have yes. this, that paperwork to send out. It's all signed, ready, sealed, and delivered. And I think we have uh, uh, your MOU also is signed. So if you want to take that, then. Uh, I think that goes to David. David? Okay, so you have that. We're all set with that. Also? Where's this one? Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. We good? Anything Thank else you. you need from us? Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. And my last uh, task was the uh, resignation of a town employee. Um, we received one with much regret, and um, I'm just going to read the letter this evening. Um, please accept this letter as notice of my formal resignation from the position of Director of Public Works with the Town of Hadley. My last day of employment will be September 30th, 2018. Take my actual accruals into consideration. I would like to thank the select board and the residents of Hadley for this opportunity. I have accepted the director's position in Greenfield. The decision has not come easy, but I feel this decision was the best for myself and my family. The department is in a position that it will continue to function well until my replacement is found. I will be available to help in any way for a smooth transition to my successor. I wish nothing but for the best for the employees, the select board, and the residents of Hadley. Marlo Warner. So, who is? So, I just want to say um, I was on the search committee um, when Marlo was first uh, hired, and you know we had we had some good candidates, and and Marlo um, obviously rose to the, the the cream rose to the top, and it was a, a pretty easy decision for us to make to bring him on board. And what a lot of folks at home don't know is, you know, sometimes um, you might be surprised to find out that there's some issues within departments that you might not have been aware of when you when you were interviewing for a job. Um, and so the things that had, you know, Hadley was a little bit behind the eight ball on. And, you know, Marlo came in with the best attitude. Um, incredibly hard worker, set an example for the others within the Department of Public Works that you know, I don't think we could have asked for anything more. Um, it's been an incredible challenge for him, um, but he's he's attacked it with grace, good sense of humor, which you always need to have around here. Um, <coughs> developed wonderful working relationships with um, the other department heads, and um, again has earned the respect of uh, the staff and so many so many folks in town. So. Uh, you know, we, we were really happy with a lot of the work of the DPW or the, you know, highway department, water sewer, years gone by, but I don't think we appreciated what it could be. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, as sad as we are that you're leaving, if it's in your best interest, you know, I certainly wish you well, and everybody does. Um, but thank you for where you've brought the department in a relatively short amount of time under very difficult circumstances. So. We will forever be grateful for that. And maybe just, I've, I've only had the DPW as a liaison for about four months, but uh, definitely made my job easier answering uh, emails and text messages, whether it's 11 p.m. or 3 a.m., it seems like. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you can see he's always here after meetings. So, I, you know, I appreciate the uh, extended hours and hard work. So, thank you. Yeah. I can't say enough, and if I've said any more, I won't be. I need a tissue for that. I a sham wild rat. I don't know. I don't know. But you, know, I, you have developed. We had a DPW department that people were resistant to um, in the beginning. And with our first DPW director, it didn't go as far as we had wanted it to go. And I can mimic everything that Molly said. You certainly have brought our DPW up to. Uh, what we had hoped for, and I just hope it continues to be well. You have worked well with the police and the fire for emergency management, and um, that has changed the scope of that department also. And uh, as she said, you've worked well with every department. So 
I appreciate everything you've done, and I do wish you and your family well. Thank you. But we'll be watching for you in the newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clean up that town common, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can't reiterate the same thing they're saying, so I'd just be repeating what they said. I think you're great in the position, and you will be missed, so I thought you did a great job from what I could see. So. And if I may, for the people at home, uh, we talked about a transition plan, and we have a a transition plan of someone to act in, in the meantime until we find a, a replacement. So uh, we'll continue on that path, and uh, I think we'll be in good hands in the meantime. So, so we will be immediately going out for a replacement and uh, advertising for another DPW director. So, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work to do. Big shoes to fill. Yeah. I've enjoyed working with you. True professional. I always like your spirit and I always like the way that you t took on adversity with a smile and a laugh. Uh, and, uh, it's a rare quality of a major part. Thank you. My turn? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, you don't um, have to. Well, I'm sure I'm going to be at the next three or four select board meetings as we, you know, there's quite a bit on the warrant. Um, so I may save a little bit for my last meeting, but. Um, <clears throat> Some of the things I said in my letter are pretty cliche, but um, it's pretty true. Uh, it was, you know, it's, it was a harder decision to leave Hadley than it was going to the first time. Um, because you talk about family, um, I think that that's what this town's about. And they brought me in like I was part of the family. Um, so I'd like to thank the taxpayer, the select board, and all the committees, my fellow department heads for the support that they gave me when I came to work. So I think we'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on, I guess. If that's possible. <laughs> Great, I always do this. Presentation of service delivery plan, 750 get back up here. Wait a minute, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Presentation of service delivery plan. We're a little bit uh, behind here, but I, I think that. Uh, David, I'd like you to give us our presentation. Um, we've had some very happy people with you working in town hall this summer and appreciate all the work that you've done. So I'll let you, you proceed with your presentation. Thank you. It's certainly a bit more of an uh, interesting situation on a slightly more chipper note. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm pleased to present to you. Hold on, it's uh, this one. It was working. <laughs> <laughs> it turned off. I know. It's, it'll take a second to pop back on. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, really well, we're waiting for this to happen. Do, does everybody know who you are? Um, my name is David Rotuno. Some of you may know me. I've been working here for the past couple of months. Um, this is my last week that I'll be um, with the town of Hadley during this two-month internship. It's been a true honor and a pleasure to, uh, to ser serve the town of Hadley and the people in various departments. And um, I made it, I hope I made it abundantly clear that um, I'm extraordinarily grateful for the opportunity that I've been provided and extraordinarily grateful for the opportunity to, um, to do everything that I've done. Uh, with that being said, one of the larger projects that I was tasked with was updating the service delivery plan for the town of Hadley in preparation for the for fiscal year 2019. This is going to be a, a, a synopsis of the updates that were made. First off, we have a bunch of quality of life improvements. Uh, in my work with the service delivery plan, just immediately when I got hands on with it, um, I noticed there, there were certain things that, need, that were pretty easy fixes 
um, essentially, and that were just basic updates. And I've compiled them all here. So we have updated dates so that everything uh, corresponds to fiscal year 2019. Uh, universalized font size and line spacing. I noticed that there were a couple places where that was a little bit off, so I just tweaked those a little bit, fixed it right up, no problem. Uh, updated language, wording, punctuation. Basically, all of this was to promote better flow through the document so that the average reader has a, uh, a simpler time navigating the document and, um, and reading what's written here. Uh, I also added hyperlinks to the page numbers in the table of context in the uh, contents in the digital version of the service delivery plan, and this basically allows for easier navigation throughout the digital version. So now, like, you just click page two, and page two corresponds to a certain um, to a certain topic, say the uh, the letter of transmittal, for instance, I believe is on page two. And, uh, and it'll just take you right there. No need to uh, scroll down painstakingly and find whatever you're looking for. Uh, up, we updated graphics on all the organizational charts basically to uh, promote better readability and aesthetic value. This basically allows, um, uh, this allows the, the whole document to look a lot nicer than it did with some of the, uh, some of the older organizational charts. And uh, in the legal mandate sections, all of the uh, important salient points that were uh, that needed to be pointed out were uh, were spaced out using bullet points. So those sections as well are mu much more readable. So here's an example of the chart update. These are uh, this is the entire chart for the town of Hadley. It's a very uh, horizontal structure. And basically, uh, what you see here is um, is better aesthetic value with a with a shadowing, and the um, the boxes themselves are less squished. I noticed in the original version there was a lot of the boxes were very tightly packed together. This one basically allows it more breathing room and uh, and a better look on the on the document. And all of this t style of update was uh, was provided for all the different organizational charts throughout the document. Uh, here are our core updates, uh, the first part of our core updates. Now these are basically updates that, uh, that I believe um, will change the way the document um, uh, performs. And basically these were major updates to the document. So we updated all the budgetary information to display current budgetary information for fiscal year 2018 and 2019 rather than 16 and 17. Important for, I believe, obvious reasons. Um, it's good to have updated budget information. And uh, there's one very important reason why that is that we'll touch upon later. Uh, we updated individual employee budgetary information to, di to display the current FY18 position, grade, step, their union membership status, and their FTE full-time employee status. Uh, we added a primary function section to the Veteran Services Department, uh, department section. So now there is a description of what the department does and, um, and how it performs its duties. Uh, we updated the community profile at the very back end of the document in order to, to reflect current uh, DOR and DLS statistics, basically allowing the, um, the document to, um, to be updated in terms of, in terms of all, all kinds of community demographics, the, the population size, uh, as well as updated bond ratings reflecting current standard and poor ratings. Moody has not given us any official bond rating as of yet. Uh, we are currently a double A bond, I believe. Double A plus. Double A plus. Double A plus. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> we also, uh, at the back end of the document, updated the cherry sheet aid for twenty for fiscal year twenty eighteen. So that basically displays all the uh, government and uh, state financial aid that we received. Uh, tax classification as well was updated similarly. Re revenue by source was updated sim similarly. So all of the town's revenues are, um, are now accounted for and listed there. And the proposition two and a half levy capacity also shows current fiscal year 2018 statistics. And the sources consulted were also reflected, or were also updated to reflect all of the new, uh, the new research that went into these updates. 
Uh, so this is an example of some of the charts that you would see in our budgetary updates. Here I've pulled up the, uh, the select board. I, of course, don't mean to pander at all. <laughs> but, um, but, but we've got uh, salaries, exp uh, expenses, generalized, but enough for the uh, average reader to understand the, um, uh, what goes into the department financially. And we have, um, a as I mentioned earlier, employee budgetary information in terms of grade step union membership, full-time employee status. Core updates too. This was one of the uh, much larger updates to the service delivery plan. And in all of the legal mandate sections where all of the um, pertinent legal information for, um, for the uh, separate departments is listed, basically how they came to be, what, um, what enables them under either Massachusetts general law or the code of the town of Hadley or a town meeting vote that was had um, usually back in the early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, and this basically allows for greater reader comprehension and uh, it creates a friendlier document for the average reader because now everybody has uh, points of references, uh, points of reference that they can look to. So originally if, if a um, if a citizen were to read this uh, this document, they would see, you know, uh, so and so department is enabled under Chapter 14, Section 24 of the uh, of Massachusetts General Law, and that's all fine, and, fine and dandy. But most people don't know right off the top of their head what that is. So I uh, I went through, pulled quotes from all of the. Uh, town town meetings, go to the town of Hadley and MGL in order to um, to appropriately represent this. So for instance, um, we have here the uh, the legal mandate section, once again for the Board of Selectmen, look at that. And um, we have all of the information about when it was established, um, the president elected, the uh, how the position of select board member came to be, the increasing of the number of select board members from three to five uh, under Article 15 in a town meeting vote in 2000, a while ago. Um, and this once again basically just allows every, um, every average reader to look through it at a glance, see the pertinent legal information, and, um, and be informed. Now, important question. I did have you listen to this all for a reason. We, have, we do have reasons why this is useful. Uh, it allows people to quickly get familiar with town government, regular citizens, uh, people who just might be looking through, even UMass students who might be looking to do a report on, uh, on local governments, things like that. It's very useful, it, this would be very useful to them in order to get an idea of all the, the way these, this particular town government functions. Uh, it organizes all the basic salient, le uh, salient legal information for all departments, which is important because spending hours looking through all the MGLs to, um, to Massachusetts General Laws, Code of the Town of Hadley, town meeting records is, uh, well, it can get tedious, so now we've just got it all right there where we need it. And it's financially beneficial. This updated budgetary information can help to defend us against uh, MCAD lawsuits, so Massachusetts Council Against Discrimination, and these typically uh, are ruled in favor of the, of the plaintiff for around $300,000. So this keeps us, uh, this is a line of defense for us getting sued. And uh, the updated community information, which is in the back half of the document as well, is necessary when applying for federal state uh, for several state and federal aid grants. So for instance, the, um, there was a certain grant that came through that David's been working very hard on as well that, uh, that required that information and we had it right there immediately. Didn't even have to uh, distress about it or do any research, it's all there. Um, and that's, it. that's uh, all the information that I have for you. I'm very happy to, it was an exciting project to be able to work on. I believe that it's uh, a, important and beneficial project to the town of Adley. And um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Appreciate it. Thanks for the work that you put in. Going to college? <laughs> <laughs> That's so wonderful. You better skip the last, <laughs> last grade and head to college. Yeah. You did a great job. Yeah. It was fun having you around the, for the summer. Nice presentation. So thank you very much. We'll keep an eye on you for the, uh, the last school year. <laughs> Or any questions for him or no? Are you going, what are you going to do, have you decided what you're going to go into when you finish high school? Uh, 
Well, high school, uh, I'm probably going to attempt to get into the undergraduate program at UMass Eisenberg. I really like to have a, uh, a business major, and that's basically the, the grand plan, as it were, is to get the business major, see if I enjoy business as a, um, as a thing to study, as a profession to go into, whatever kind of business I, I choose. And, uh, and if not, I'm also very interested in becoming a lawyer, so that's... Um, and a uh, lawyer with a business degree would be certainly be useful as a corporate lawyer, which is exact, which is what I would personally enjoy being, and that's uh, that's the goal, really. It's um, an exciting process. Well, if that's the path you take, may our our paths never cross. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, maybe well, he could I'll be on your our side. side. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 That's true. That be oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that you're going to succeed very well. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Really great job. Right. Wish you well. Thanks, David. No problem. Good All job. right. So our next one is the Connecticut River <laughs> Levy Geotechnical Survey. Welcome. Did you hear <laughs> this is so that the center of town doesn't flood away, folks. <laughs> Or become an oxbow. <laughs> we could yeah. become an oxbow. Yes. All right. We'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Rich Niles. I'm the project manager with what <coughs> formerly known as Amic Foster Wheeler. Uh, we changed the company name beginning of this year. Um, so what we're going to talk about is the results of a study we did for the town's levy system. And this is a study where it's a continuation of a process that we've been doing uh, with the town to do a more comprehensive evaluation of this system <clears throat> in the context of, of uh, FEMA criteria. So we're just gonna give a little bit of background for those of you that haven't been aware of what's happening and for the general public. Um, then we'll talk about the actual study results, uh, the criteria that we're trying to evaluate uh, the system for, conclusions and recommendations. I wish the police officers were still here in Marlow somewhere. Um, but I wanna thank them for their support in this project. So we had a Bit of a challenge uh, with access to some locations, um, particularly the rail trail. So we had to drill along the rail trail. We had to get an access permit from DCR. We had to have traffic management plan. Um, believe it or not, you have to have a traffic management plan for any type of, uh, of roadway like this, which is what's considered. And um, DPW, here it is, saying thanks for your help on the um, traffic detail. Um, yep. So we had to purchase new signs, we had to you know, do quite a few things and, and had the police department provided uh, support during that process so that we could drill safely <clears throat> and people could still pass. So we had to keep the rail trail active at the same time. So thanks to town for supporting that. So this is uh, an overview of the levy system. You can see this green line is what is known as the you know, Hadley Levy, Hadley Dyke. is typically what you're used to maintaining in town. Um, this is the, the rail trail, but the rail trail actually acts as an embankment that provides flood protection. So this red area here is the 500 year floodplain. Everything in, I guess that's a grayish green, is um, the mapped 100 year floodplain. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's about 1.7 miles for this segment and it's about 1.5 miles for this segment in here. Um, and um, so th what's important is, is that this is how FEMA recognizes the floodplain as currently mapped. And so this is, this is a really important consideration how we've been conducting this evaluation. Um, FEMA is going through a process of remapping nationwide. They've remapped certain counties within Massachusetts. So floodplain boundaries are changing due to better data, uh, different methodologies and how they evaluate limits of floodplains. And <clears throat> when it comes to constructed embankments that provide flood protection, there's certain criteria that those embankments need to meet. So at some point, FEMA may say, we're gonna remap your area and we need to look at whether your embankment, your dike, your levy system meets current design standards, okay? <clears throat> so this is the really boring part. Um, federal context, so this is the regulation and, and like I said, it has specific requirements relative to the design and construction of levies. 
FEMA only recognizes those systems that meet those standards. And so if, if you can't demonstrate that you meet those standards, then they will essentially remap the floodplain as if it doesn't exist. And so that's, that's the potential consequence of not being able to meet the criteria. Um, in addition to if it's not meeting the criteria, it, in many cases, it, it may not be deemed safe or it's at risk um, for, for future um, flooding, et cetera. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but just a brief history. So it was constructed in 1928. There was a breach in 1936 that was repaired by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, additional work was performed in 1948. A uh, portion was armored by the U.S. Army Corps in 2001. Uh, I think believe that's just some uh, stone armoring along the lower embankments where the, where the water line typically is, because you know, that has a potential to erode sometimes. <clears throat> and then um, a crack was detected in 2003, and a section failed in 2009 and was subsequently repaired. Uh, and then we began our evaluation, our initial evaluation in 2014. And I'll recap that next. <clears throat> So the 2014 study that we did, we call it a, a, a phase one preliminary study. So we're looking, we looked at the system to see what's the likelihood of it meeting FEMA's criteria for certification. And taking a stepwise approach to say, okay, here's the, the main criteria. If you don't meet, it's a systematic um, issue. Meaning um, if it's not tall enough, for example. So a freeboard analysis, that's one of the major criteria. Um, so, but what it allowed us to do is take an initial look at it and say, okay, what do we think based on, on, on a pretty low cost initial evaluation? And then what would we need to do to pursue certification? What would we need to figure out next? What's the scope of work? <clears throat> so the scope of work for this initial study was an assessment of available data. We did a, a field inspection and preliminary freeboard analysis to see is it high enough above the base flood elevation during a 100 year flood? Does it have enough freeboard, um, which is at least, at least two to three feet? Um, and so, <clears throat> The um, phase two scope of work was to develop what are the next major components that you need to pursue to, to look at certification and address all the other design criteria. Um, so detailed freeboard analysis, we completed that in November 2014, and the results of that analysis said it meets the freeboard criteria, except for one spot at West Street. It's a slow, low-lying area, pretty easy to remedy that, so that's good. That was a good, good, good uh, finding. Um, the next phase is, is what we just completed, uh, is the embankment foundation stability and settlement, which we call it our geotechnical study. And then phase three uh, has a whole bunch of other items we'll talk about a little bit. Um, so this is the kind of a detailed rundown of the scope of work that we just completed. Um, the embankment and foundation stability consideration. So we consider all these different things in our analysis, the depth of flooding, the duration of flooding, the embankment geometry, so how steep are the slopes, how wide is the, is the embankment, um, you know, what's the compaction and, and consistency of materials throughout that embankment? Do we have any soft spots? Is it, does it meet compaction requirements? Um, other design factors such as, as seepage, um, you know, can water seep through the embankment and saturate it in a condition that will then result in, in failure of that, you know, just like you build a sandcastle and pour water on it and eventually collapses. Um, so the settlement considerations are, is, is, it, is it going to settle any further than what it's at now? What's the foundation beneath the, the constructed embankment, and is the embankment itself going to settle? So this is what, this is essentially the scope of work. So in order to gather data to do that evaluation, we, we perform drilling and testing activities. So we, uh, and I have a map next to show you these locations, um, but we did 10, 10 borings in the crest, so along the very top of it, where people typically are walking. And then we did eight land sides, so on the opposite side of the river, uh, tow borings, so we can get an understanding of what's beyond the levee and what's beneath it as well at those locations. And then, so those steps uh, range from anywhere from 15 feet along the rail trail uh, to about 71 feet in some of the locations. It's pretty deep. What we're trying to do is we, we typically want to get one and a half times the height of the levee beneath the levee so we can look at the foundation soils. Um, and so we do what's called standard penetration testing, um, and it's basically you have a hollow stem auger rig, you drill through, and then you slide a rod down and you hammer it. And then you, you, you count based on dropping an you know, 80 pound hammer, how many blow counts does it take to get six inches, every six inches, and you continue to do that throughout the entire hole down to section one feet. Um, so some of these, these locations took up to two days to do. Um, and so that gives you data on the compaction. We also grab samples throughout that, so we can send those samples to a laboratory as well as evaluate them in the field. 
So we sent select samples to a laboratory for a variety of soil characteristics, um, and so, so we, can, we, can, we can incorporate all that data into the analysis. So what we found was that the, the embankment, the fill, ranges anywhere from six feet high to 15 feet, is, is the, the constructed embankment. Um, and most of that embankment consists of, of silty sand and sand with isolated intervals of clay and silt. Okay, so probably materials that were used in the area locally um, around the time it was constructed. So this is showing the, the uh, flood protection system <clears throat> as it's you know, recognized in the FEMA maps currently. These you know, yellow and orange dots are the locations of where we drilled. So they're spaced kind of evenly throughout. Um, we did limit it a little bit more on the rail trail. DCR um, had, had a little bit of a tizzy when we said we're going to punch all these holes in the trail. <laughs> they just paid. So, um, so we, we toned it back a little bit and, and we felt that that was still appropriate because we're still looking at some of the critical sections of that system. <clears throat> and so what we do is we look at, okay, based on the geometry of the levee embankments um, and how it changes through the course of that, because in some areas it's, it's a little bit wider, some areas it's, it's um, you know, <clears throat> it, it is um, not as high because of the natural ground surface, et cetera. So we, we capture what we call representative sections, and then we look at and we do an analysis of representative um, data points, which are the boring locations. So that represents a segment of the levee. We feel that this point here gives us soil information that is relatively consistent with what we're seeing and observing along the, these embankments. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> because we, it's just cost prohibitive, and it really doesn't necessarily get us Better results if we punch in 30 more holes. So, <clears throat> so this is this is part of the analysis. We, we dissect the levee system a little bit, and then we look at those critical sections, and and do our evaluation uh, per the criteria for FEMA. So, <clears throat> when we look at the geomorphology, so that's that's how the river system changes over time, how oxbows form and the river meanders and such. So, when we looked at historical records and the soil data for the area. Um, we don't really find any evidence that say that that this that the river has meandered in this area, and that there's a uh, a sandbar or something that the levee embankment is on top of something that would compromise the the stability of the embankment due to changes in uh, historical changes in river course, which so that's a good thing. So so we don't think that that's a factor. Geomorphology is not um, a consideration in terms of the um, stability. So <clears throat> when we did the seepage analysis, so we look at. Each of these critical sections, seven sections throughout there, throughout the system that I, that I showed you earlier. <clears throat> Here's the height of the embankment, feet and elevation, uh, elevation feet rather. Um, the base flood elevation, so that's the 100 year flood, the elevation at that section um, of where the flood waters would be in relation to the crest. And you can see, you know, we're just a couple feet below, so you have your freeboard over here. And so the, what we call the X and gradient is, is, the, is the resulting calculation of, of the seepage analysis to say, when you have a flood up against your embankment for a sustained amount of time, um, what's the likelihood that it's going to seep through the embankment mm -hmm. and result in, in displacement of soils and such? And so there was only one location, critical section two, and I'll, I'll show you where that is on the map, um, where it doesn't meet the required design criteria. So, so that's not too bad. That's something that's not too hard to remedy, seepage in and of itself. And you can also have, you can have a permanent fix to remedy that in terms of addressing the embankment uh, soils, but you can also address it through flood fighting measures. You can have temporary response measures that can also address these types of things too. So when we look at the slope stability factor, factors of safety, <coughs> um, we have each of the sections again. We have different cases, case A, B, and C. So these are the design criteria cases. So case A is normal stage. That means stage is, refers to the height of the river. So flood stage, normal stage. Normal stage is what we consider ordinary high water, or ordinary water level. <clears throat> um, so there's different factors of safety that are required for each of those water levels when we look at it in terms of the slope stability. So when we ran the calculations, the land side stability was pretty good. The riverside stability, at, 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 again, at normal water levels, normal, normal river levels, uh, failed the criteria or did not meet the criteria um, just by a little bit, uh, the factor of safety at three locations. So we look at the next criteria, case B. This is this is a um, long-term flood stage. So this is a hundred-year flood uh, for an extended duration at that elevation. What's the stability of the slope? 
at, at that point. <coughs> and, and we really need to look at the land side uh, portion. And we see that we have uh, a couple sections that still continue to not meet that criteria. And so factors of safety <coughs> are, are built into the, into the criteria because it accounts for unknowns. It accounts for the fact that we don't know everything about every single portion of that system because we haven't studied every grain of soil and just other factors that can occur that are sort of outside our normal sphere of what we consider for um, engineering influence or influence on, on the uh, system. So um, just because it doesn't meet factor state doesn't mean it's, it's at risk of imminent failure. Uh, so I just want that to be clear. And this means that this slope embankment is, is likely to slough, uh, which at flood stage could result in a breach of the embankment, it depends on the conditions. So <clears throat> but when we look at um, a sudden drawdown case, five of the seven don't meet the criteria that are the required factor of safety. And, and sudden drawdown is kind of an anomaly, so I don't want this to, to frighten people too much. It, it does not meet the design criteria, but a sudden drawdown scenario means you're at flood stage and, and you quickly, the river goes down. So that could happen under scenarios where maybe you have an ice jam. An ice jam could result in an unexpected flood that reaches the 100 year flood zone, not because of precipitation. Um, that has happened in the past in the Connecticut and resulted in flooding. Um, so if an ice jam breaks, that could result in sudden drawdown. So you quickly have a saturated embankment on your levee system that has pressure holding up against it and it's somewhat saturated. And then when you release all that water and draw it down, there's no, there's no force that's exerting against that embankment anymore. And it has more potential to fail. So, <clears throat> um, so that's, this is the real technical stuff. Um, so to summarize, <coughs> the the um, did I cover the foundation? I'm sorry, um, I didn't specifically, but um, so the foundation soils, including the rail trail berm itself, um, they're, they're not they're, they're pretty decent materials actually. Um, it's mostly related to the geometry of the embankments, which is why the slope the slopes don't meet the factors of safety. So <coughs> what we estimated for settlement of the uh, foundation. Is, is about four and, four and a quarter inches. Uh, and it sounds ridiculous that you can even estimate that, but um, that's, that's how it, it works out in calculations over the 90 year life of the levee. And so we think that was probably already settled, meaning once it was built, it's settled to the point where it's not gonna settle any further. So we think settlement is negligible. So there shouldn't be any issues with settlement and, and impacts to the system due to that. So that's a good thing. Um, so it's negligible. Um, so here's a, a kind of an overview of this is the, the orange is, is our sections that don't meet the slope stability criteria. The pink or whatever that is in the middle um, doesn't meet the slope stability and, and seepage as well. So that's that one section that doesn't meet the seepage. Criteria. That's where the landfill is, right? Uh, landfill is actually right here. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually just below where we already uh, reinforced the levee uh, back in 2000. Right. So that section is actually right about here. Um, so we did not we did not investigate that section. We didn't drill through it for obvious reasons because it was repaired. Um, but also it was repaired with a geogrid type system. And if we drill through that, yeah. we compromise the integrity of that potentially. Because a geogrid is, is an actual, it's, it's a, a constructed material that's meant to hold the soil together. And augering through that means you chew it apart. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that also, that it's also, um, there are um, the sheet piling along the river I mean, it's, it's pretty heavily armored. I think that's probably the last section you need to worry about. Um, although we don't have enough information uh, to, to, to say it does meet the criteria specifically for that section, but we feel that, um, yeah, again, that's, that's, that's probably least priority. So when you're talking about slope geometry as, as a fix, could you widen the top of the levee make it wider in order to fix that in order to actually want to widen the base widen the base okay right and so you have to or you could or you could buttress it there's a couple different ways you can there's a variety of ways you can do that actually i'm just wondering how so, big of a repair or how big of a job is it well the the issue is is, is it's extensive so you're you're looking at a long system of, of um, where geometry would need to be addressed so I'll, I'll get we'll get to the recommendations in just a minute, and I, I think we'll, we can talk more about that. It's probably more fitting because there's, there's other things to do or to consider that are maybe more short term. Um, this is this is a significant investment to address. 
and that's something that the town is going to want to you know consider further um, I think you know, we're recommending that you do some alternative analysis and some engineering analysis to say okay what would it take to do that you know what are the best options um, so just to kind of additional findings this is kind of just to recap some of the things from past studies um, so that's that's the result of the geotechnical study the seepage and stability analysis <clears throat> I mentioned before um, the free board deficiency so there's a low spot at West Street that's something that could be easily addressed uh, we did note um, that there's animal burrows, there's uh, what we call unwanted vegetative growth, meaning, um, you know, FEMA and Army Corps like to see nice grass embankments on levees that are well maintained, you can see everything, you can inspect it easily, you can see animal burrows, you can see any issues with settlements or cracks and things like that or erosion. Um, so that's something that I think, you know, these types of things are more maintenance activities. Um, sod cover, meaning, the trail is worn, you know, so technically you're supposed to have adequate saw cover to minimize any erosion. I don't see a lot of surface erosion occurring, uh, but that's something that we may need to think about. Um, encroachments, anything that's too close to it, trees or structures, there are some isolated in issues of, of encroachments. Um, and then there's, there's penetrations, um, meaning, meaning mostly drainage systems that go through the levee embankment at, at some locations that we're reasonably aware of, but we can't find. Um, so there's some investigation that needs to be done to look at those. We did find um, there's some large penetrations in the rail trail berm. <clears throat> so this is a 42 inch culvert. It doesn't have a closure device. So this, this culvert is beneath the rail trail and it's below the elevation of a 100 year flood. So <clears throat> if it floods, well, Route 9 is going to flood anyway, but it's also going to flood the protected area to some degree. So having a closure device on that reduces the potential for the for the flooding of the protected area. Um, this is owned and operated by DCR. So, so our, our recommendations would be to develop an operational maintenance plan for the system. But for this specifically, try to have an agreement with DCR to at least access and be able to employ flood fighting measures, which could be, you know, you could be putting sandbags, you could be using an inflatable plug to make them that big. Um, or you could do a more permanent enclosure, like a flap gate that is locked and you act and then when you unlock it and then you close it. Yeah. So um, anyway, so th these are other considerations. One of the things that we, um, you know, I noted that you don't control the rail trail berm. <clears throat> so if it's acting as a, a flood protection system, the way it's currently mapped, um, you don't have any control over that. So you don't have control over what's done to it, how it's maintained, um, utilities within that, or access to it, technically. I'm sure if there's an emergency that would take precedence, but you should have an agreement with DCR for that. Um, potential levee scour along the river, that's something that probably needs to be looked at closer over time, is to make sure that, you know, we've looked at the embankments, but access to the toe of the slope is difficult. Um, we didn't specifically assess that in the study, and that has been a potential concern in the past. That may have, what caught, that may have been what caused um, the slope failure back in 2009, uh, in part, as well as this, the lack of stability of the slope. Um, so, the category captures some of this. Um, so, you don't meet the criteria of, of 44 CFR 6510. Um, and so, what we're seeing is, is widespread low factors of safety for stability of the slopes um, along the riverside slopes primarily during certain conditions. And so, getting to remediation methods. So, you know, slope stability could be flattening slopes, buttressing slopes, and improving the strength of the soil. So there's ways you can improve the soil strength without expanding the levee system significantly so that those slopes don't fail. Um, or, you know, a combination of those methods based upon the change in geometry, what's most appropriate for the section. So that's something that, that you know, could be looked at closer to develop, um, you know, an estimate of, of what it would take to remedy that. Are there sections that we should prioritize maybe? Um, and then that way the town can look at how you might plan for that uh, from a capital investment standpoint. So what we're suggesting for recommendations here is to perform a preliminary design evaluation. Um, and that's not meant to be self-serving, it's meant to give you guys answers about what it would cost to remedy some of these situations. And, um, and look at estimates of probable cost. Um, and then proceed with portions of phase 2C <clears throat> to look at um, how you might meet the other criteria. But, I say portions because some of the some of the two C scope of work items are generating a big fancy report, which I think you got other things to do before that. Um, 
And so operation maintenance plan, looking at interior drainage, closure structures, uh, and, and enhanced maintenance uh, is something that um, would fall under what we call our, our recommended 2C scope of work. Um, so if you refer back to that phase one study, it breaks those things down further. Um, so what we're recommending, again, kind of to recap some of the other uh, pre previous study results is, is again, perform maintenance um, or increase the maintenance program. You guys are doing maintenance now. Um, the town does, I don't want you to think that there's no maintenance at all, but the town does mow the slopes um, and they, you know, if there's any damage that's observed, you guys repair it. There's certain gates to restrict access. Those are obviously maintained. Um, but there's, there's additional um, maintenance that needs to occur. Uh, and a lot of that's driven by what FEMA and Army Corps criteria requires. You know, so it's a little bit, a little bit more than routine. Um, and then um, address the freeboard deficiency along the rail trail berm at West Street. Uh, work with DCR to develop an agreement. Um, so as challenging as it may seem, um, it, hopefully it's, it's something that, that the town can pursue. Um, and uh, consider alternatives to pursuing FEMA certification for the rail trail berm. So this is something that through initial analysis of what it would take to remedy this, the rail trail berm really doesn't meet a lot of criteria actually. Um, technically we would have to cut every tree along the slope in order to maintain that as a, as a flood control structure that meets FEMA criteria. I think that's unlikely to happen um, with them controlling it. It would be different if the town were doing it, but I think you'd have a lot of upset people as well. Um, and the slope stability issues, you have that, that rail trail berm runs behind a lot of properties. Um, so I think it may be challenging. So that's something that we can look at closer to see is it, is it feasible to do that? What would the cost be to do that? But we suggest looking at an alternative to say, okay, well, or alternatives, you can pursue certification just for your levy portion. <clears throat> and, and if that portion of the rail trail berm was not able to be certified, we can look at, well, what resulting protection do we have? And, and so we can look at the change in floodplain associated with that scenario and just say, okay, well, we're still gonna maintain it as is, but we're not gonna pursue certification and remedy the entire system. So one of the things that we, we thought of that the town may wanna to consider, and, and this, is, this is like throwing a hand grenade in the room, uh, but if you're gonna, if, if you decide to invest in, in upgraded this, looking at the length of this system and what it protects for properties within here, you could spend similar money and protect a lot more property within the floodplain. So the question is, what's the, what's the cost benefit of doing that? Um, is, this, is this feasible? Is this even feasible for one? Um, is it a crazy idea? Uh, or is it a better use of dollars if the town chooses to invest at that level? Uh, and so this is, this is throwing it out there requires a lot more thought <laughs> than drawing a line on a map, obviously. But um, I don't want people to think that this is the only option. So where would the Army Corps of Engineers stand with all this? They're the original ones that built the levy. Uh, we right. couldn't get anything out of them when we had a break. Well, that's, that's one of the challenges. We've talked about this in the past, David. And one of the challenges is because it's not an Army Corps um, credit system. The town owns it. They built it, but they hand it over to you guys. And so there's, there's really little to no funding available to do some of this work. Um, Questions from the public? Mm -hmm. So back with Irene or one of the big storms so many years ago, we were watching docks floating by, a lot of pumpkins and stuff. And I heard afterwards that the biggest problem with letting the river get that high during a hurricane flood system was lack of coordination between all the dam owners up north. And that there had been better coordination with all the private power companies and, and dam owners. They never would have let the river rise that much and a lot of destruction, especially up north, could have been avoided. That's right. probably not part of your world as an engineer, but do you ever hear a discussion that um, they are now communicating among each other better? Yeah, I mean, we haven't talked to the New York Army Corps office recently, <clears throat> but I mean, that, that is a reason why, um, you know, when we did the analysis to look at Freeboard, we developed a river rate model. So we surveyed cross sections of the river to get the bathymetry of the river so we could look at the channel geometry and all the upstream controls. So we're looking at the watershed and what's coming to it and then how does, what happens when it reaches your section of the river and expands into, into the floodplain, potentially. Um, upstream dam control is a huge factor in 
how the river responds. Um, it also depends upon how the storm comes. You know, if it's a spring event with a lot of snow melt uh, or ice jams, so there's always going to be some factors that are difficult to predict. Um, now, you guys haven't really reached a flood stage, a, a hundred year flood stage in quite, I mean, it's not in recent years, not in recent decades. Four. Yeah. So it, the system hasn't really been tested, you know. Um, Okay. Not that we want to, uh, but <laughs> what's so, that test? Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I, and, and so, so it, it is a good point. So, but some of those things are outside of your control. Um, that's something that, that we we could talk to with the town and say, hey, we're we're looking at alternatives here, and we want to minimize the you know in the current state, we want to make sure that we can protect it as much as possible. So that is an option to to, to talk to them. We could see what Army Corps is doing recently for coordinating that. I'm but I think that's FEMA or somebody in the core, but I don't know. Yeah, it's it's most likely the core actually, because so they because they do. Um, you're probably right. They are involved in other levy systems along the river, just not yours. Is there a way to, I guess, certify this and get the Army Corps of Engineers to take over responsibility for the, the levy, or is that no. does not, that not happen? I'm just thinking. They're supposed to be responsible so, for all major waterways, and you right. can't get anything more major than the Connecticut River. Right. Without so, this. so if you met design criteria, you could you could um, be eligible to receive funding. Okay. That's the benefit of <clears throat> meeting the criteria. So um, there's, there's Army Corps, Army Corps, Corps and team, and team of funding. Yeah. We deal with this with a lot of other communities in the Northeast. That they, it's it's quite surprising that there's not a good access to funding. <laughs> Um, until a disaster happens, which yeah. is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, it's the usual way. Right, and it costs twice as much. Right. And just out of curiosity, your purple line there, how high would that need to be, roughly speaking, from the current grade, would you say? I just don't know if you're well, talking about well, two feet or 20 feet. Well, <laughs> from a perspective, I mean, so, so I think it'd probably be something relative, no higher than the, than the uh, rail trail burn. Like three or four feet, probably. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more than that because you look at the crossing here. Um, it's you, know, you come up quite a bit. It's probably it's probably five or six. You know, maybe five or six. But the flood elevation is slightly less down here. So as you travel from from mm -hmm. north to the south, you have a, you have a gradient of the river. So it is a little bit less in terms of the flood stage stage elevation. But when you look back at that first slide, um, your the the, the hundred year floodplain extends almost up to Mill Street. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of property here that is currently purchasing flood insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so the question we the question we pose to communities sometimes is, well, is it worth evaluating a protection system that's going to benefit you more? If you're already paying for flood insurance, we're not saying you're not going to pay something for it because you have to pay for the construction of it. But flood insurance is just the it's only if you have a loss. Nobody wants to have a loss. So people want to have their houses protected. Um, a policy just replaces that. But this actually protects. You know, so that's and, and so the benefit to the community could be could be greater. Um, it, it's not without a pretty significant undertaking. So it's actually something that's very significant because if you look at what FEMA uh, the the requirement of FEMA for the first story of both flood stage, it now includes basements. So 84, we flooded all the way up West Street to none of all those basements got flooded. Under new, under today's criteria, for them to collect, those basements have to be removed. So there is a huge benefit to all these houses and what could be a huge disaster for them. It is something that would be very beneficial. And, and you're right, there's only a couple points along that Bay Road that's significant in height. The one is at Bay at uh, West Street and Bay Road, and the other is to the other end. But that's a good analogy to think about moving it. Well, certainly all of this is will be taken under consideration you know we'll have to absorb it yeah no I, and, and we we just wanted to you know so the, the geotechnical study has its specific recommendations mm -hmm. what well, you guys are proceeding through process of evaluating a variety of, of criteria um, to 
to meet, meet design criteria. And when we're looking at potential remedies and costs associated with those, um, it's worth considering other options when you're looking at not just a couple sections, you're looking at a system that you don't maintain, or I'm sorry, you don't own, you can't maintain. Um, and if that were to be upgraded, is it even feasible? And would the money be better spent somewhere else with greater benefit? So it's um, it is getting pretty high level and, and, and looking at a really big issue. Um, so there's a lot of things to chew through in terms of the recommendations from past studies, and then to consider something further. So we'll have to talk further about you know how the town might want to proceed with that. Um, but but that's 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 the result, and those are some of our recommendations. David, is any of this in the capital plan right now? So we have the, uh, the fun third and final phase of the uh, of the study in the capital that plan. Is in there. Yeah. But we just received these results, so we haven't plugged anything into the capital plan. Our actual for solutions, yeah. The geotechnical portion of it. Okay. So uh, one, one of your, you go back to the earlier slides, you're talking about doing a phase two study. This was the, or some kind, yeah, right there. <coughs> So we just did we did phase two A and two B, two C is what David's referring to. Um, that's the last portion of what we scoped in order to meet certification criteria. But that assumes that you meet it along the way, which we did, right? right. Which we don't, yeah. You, so you guys have been. I mean, this was this was a, a, an expensive study. It, it's a lot of field investigation. It's a lot of drilling. A lot of laboratory work. Um, the initial study was was low cost to give you an idea. And then we did the freeboard analysis, which was the next critical step. Again, not, not a huge investment, but a critical component to, to the system is making sure it's tall enough. Um, and then this was the next big one, which was, okay, it's tall enough, but is it stable enough under those conditions? And 2C is, is addressing interior drainage, operation and maintenance manuals, and then basically packaging this all up in a nice fancy report to, to FEMA to certify. But we can't do that if you're not meeting the criteria. So that's why I say certain items of phase 2C would be appropriate. Others you wouldn't bother with because you don't have the information and data to support it. So, so are we going into a phase of any kind of conceptual design or what we need to do to make that criteria, I guess? Or is that in C phase 2C? Well, it, it's in we'll part. In part. So yeah. what we need to do is look at phase 2C and say, okay, what should we really be doing now that we know what we know? Yeah, this was okay. scoped. Four years ago, before yeah. we did all, yeah. yeah. So you're right; it is. It has changed shape a bit, um, and so you know, does the town want to do a cost-benefit analysis and look at an alternative system? Um, you know, so we can we can kind of outline what may make the most sense in terms of, of what to bite off to give you to give you better information to make make decisions to plan. I'd like it to be affordable. Affordable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody does. <laughs> I mean, it, it, but you guys are following uh, uh, what I think is a very detailed, um, logical process, so that as you learn information, you, you can make better decisions. And and, and um, like I said, just because they don't meet the factors of, of safety means you can't certify. It doesn't mean it's going to fail. Um, we would obviously never recommend that you, you just leave it the way it is, but um, it, with any remedy, it's going to take time to develop that and, and fund it, whatever level of remedy you should choose. Um, and so it's a, it's a long-term process. I guess so answer. do we need to make a decision tonight to move forward with the 2C or what? what, what, what do we do? Well, that's part of the capital. capital. That will be yeah. part of the capital. So okay. and when I first came here, our maintenance plan for the dike was to wait till it broke and then they would all we'll hands worry on, about it then. Yeah, <laughs> all hands on deck and all <laughs> just mm -hmm. patched together. And so once we settled the dust Get your boats. on the 2009 uh, breach, uh, I said, we, this is a critical piece of infrastructure. We know nothing about it. Uh, let's start taking the time to put together these reports. Thank you, Rich, for doing them, so that we understand this critical piece of infrastructure and start developing plans for addressing it like we do with our other infrastructure, roads, bridges, culverts, mm -hmm. water, sewer, lines. All right, so I guess we'll be back at you after it goes to capital. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about it. <coughs> What's appropriate? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
<laughs> hopefully before we, hopefully before we flood. I think we can take all of the um, water maintenance all in one one sweep because they were all due to software failure. So could I entertain a motion for those? Recommend we approve the water abatements at the suggestion of the collector. Second. Uh, that would be for 72 North Maple Street, 87 Hockenham, and 180 Russell Street. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And uh, let's skip over the town meeting warrant. Do you want to do that? Or shall we go to the so I guess we're on to old business. Uh, it's getting old and it's the library and senior center and sub fire station updates. Um, I'll just say on the sub fire station update we have a meeting tomorrow night. Uh, there's been some topographical uh, surveys being done up there so that's on the move. And that's about where we are right now. I'll have more reported the next meeting. And all right, who wants to go first? Library or senior center? It's a site review for the whole project. We'll let you go first. What shall we do? <laughs> I might be hanging myself by the end of this, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, so, well, so just quickly to bring everybody who may not know exactly where we're at. Last night there was a planning board meeting. Um, no vote was taken. Uh, the straw poll that was requested would indicate that um, as of last night it would not have the required four um, votes in favor. Um, and uh, council um, asked on behalf of the town to schedule another planning board meeting to be held on September 11th. Um, so so no vote from the planning board right now, no approval nor a denial from the planning board. That's where we're at right now. Madam Chair. No, oh, Madam Chair. Uh, here we go. No wonder you tossed it to me this year. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Molly. Um, I, I guess we just need to know where we're where we're going to go. Um, of course, I think that the biggest issue that we're facing is they just cannot get off of the parking issue. Um, so that's mainly one of the big things. But I, I really have to say, and I've, I've been trying to tame my mouth down for tonight, but you know, I, I think we have two um, planning board members that have asked us to do several things on several occasions, and we're jumping through hoops every time that we are asked to do something. and. I don't ever think that this project is going to be passed at the planning board meeting. Um, they have a problem with the design. Uh, they don't like where it is. We don't have enough parking. Um, the roof isn't right. So we have articles on, you know, for the fall town meeting to address some of these issues. Um, the roof issue, you know, seeing if we can get that passed. Um, but I don't, I don't really know if it's going to be enough of what we need to do to please these two planning board members when we think they asked for a Dover amendment by a, a independent lawyer and that was one of those gentlemen that did that and we went out and did that, Mr. Reedy did that and um, they still were not satisfied with it, they still don't believe it. Um, so I, I'm not sure how many, which ways we can do something. They now want us to purchase more property um, that abuts this. Um, I, I guess I'm just at a standstill of, of what we can actually do to move these projects forward. And we have a, a library grant sitting there that if we don't move forward with this, we're going to lose that. We, so also, we also have inflationary construction we costs. Inflation. Every month it's costing the combined projects $10,000. We do, and, I, and I, I, just, I just don't think that, that they're going to change their minds on this project. So what are the options? How about the CBA? 
That was thrown out last night, and to my surprise, I think I heard him say, Jim, that we should have gone to the ZBA earlier for the parking variance, if there is such a thing. And we, apparently, we did go to them for something. I can't I don't remember where it was. Well, I think, right you know, we have on the fall town well, meeting. It seems, it seems backwards, but. Yeah. We want to put on fall town meeting to change the bylaw for well, municipal buildings and parking. Um, so that we is do that anyway. something that we're, you know, um, we'll be talking, we'll be about, talking that about that when we talk about town meeting warrant. We need to open up the uh, warrant to put some articles on tonight, too. So that's um, what we're going to be doing. So. Joyce, may I? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, can I talk about kind of what we've been working in, in, in the meantime? Mm -hmm. um, well, that was the other thing that they yeah. uh, did mention. They are unsettled about that. The select board has not been uh, forthcoming with plans for where everybody's going to be displaced to uh, when the senior center comes down. So I have told them that we are working on it, and we were, are working on it, and David has been... Um, doing things too, so I'll let him take it from here. Well, besides the fact that it shouldn't influence their approval uh, about what we're going to do with the various boards and committees meeting locations, um, we've been working on a, a couple of different avenues, whether that's rearranging town hall offices. Uh, Tim had some, some good solutions for jamming more people into this building, uh, using the, the office spaces more effectively. Uh, Chris, if you don't want, if you don't mind interrupting, <laughs> I went to municipal building committee last night, and there is a plan here that we can share for uh, doing this. So, so, so that's an option. Um, Christian and I had had talked about um, the option of renting trailers, trailer space, just for temporary meeting locations, double, triple wide construction trailers, just for office spaces, and sticking behind Russell School, whatever we needed to do in the meantime. Uh, Molly reached out to. Can uh, Most Holy Redeemer and ask them if we can make use of their hall for senior center uh, meeting location in the meantime um, in, in office space. They were more than happy to accommodate us. So we have plenty of options and um, one of the things that we've been exploring is maybe we need to move forward with the library immediately separately than the senior center, knock down other school and get moving on that project so we don't lose the grant money. Um, and then in the meantime, keep working the senior center approval issue. Um, but e either way, we've, we've got the, a variety of solutions available for meeting space and for uh, senior center activity space and, and things like that. So uh, the church is more than happy to cooperate. I'll let you pick, uh, it kind of pass along any yeah, sentiments and, there. And again, the, I've spoke with um, the priest we have a relatively new priest i think he's been here for about eight months now um and he actually it was interesting when i broached the topic very gingerly not knowing what sort of reaction um, i might get uh he said oh we did this in westfield so he actually has experience where the, the parish center um there was used for swing space for another i think he said it might have been a library project or some something like that in westfield and, and successfully he said it was a win-win for people because the, you know from a church's standpoint they always want to be part of the community you know and um, help in whatever way they can um, handicapped accessible kitchen uh, typically not in use during the day you know parish centers more often are used in the evenings obviously sundays um, so and, and he threw out i was just asking about you know senior center activities and he said we also have all the classrooms so if you needed more space for offices as long as the town is willing to pick up you know whatever technology costs or things like that might be incurred um you know come to the table with that and uh, more more than happy to have that conversation so so you know I, I thought that was good news i mean that that's a pretty significant offer because i was having a lot of difficulty imagining the senior center running, running around uh, in trailers you know that wasn't <laughs> really working and I know we've talked about the Hampshire Mall before too that would probably be pretty pricey not to mention the safety considerations of the parking lots and, and et cetera there I think, the, oh, no, I, was gonna say, I think the goal for the whole board is to get some momentum going get something started and rolling so we're not if we can't avoid the infl inflation costs and the inflation increases on both projects at least we can get rolling on one project and you know get that underway and keep 
battling for the other project at the same time. The problem is that they want these answers, but if we don't have a definitive answer from them, then how can we move forward to, you know, reserve the space that, you know, they want us to do or readjust everything? If we have a yes from them, we can go right into action of what we can do and, and make it happen. Uh, we're not sitting back, not looking at things. We can make this happen, so. So just on that, could you clarify what the planning board is asking for? I mean, do they have a solution on the table for uh, how to move forward? I guess you didn't watch it, did you? I did not. No. <laughs> um, they do not have a solution for us. No. no. Well, we we just know that there are two, yeah. two votes that are not in favor right now. And they, they have their reasons that they articulated, but it's a little bit of a moving moving target, to be honest. Oh, so they haven't laid out any kind of roadmap about how to move forward. Well, well they, 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 did, no, they did a month, two weeks ago, and we met those, and now they're new ones. Yeah. I was going to say, at the Municipal Building Committee meeting we had last night, a couple of things came up. Maybe David can address it, but with the um, most holy redeemer, do we need to put that out for bid, or can we go directly and start negotiating with them about well, we can possibly certainly, We can certainly have a conversation with them, uh, and, and based upon the, the results of that conversation, then okay. will tell us whether we go out to bid or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's so we would be looking at various criteria, cost, uh, the uniqueness of the property, and whether that would uh, allow us to utilize that part of procurement law that talks about unique acquisitions. Uh, the amenities they have there versus another yeah. commercial space that may not have a kitchen and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Kitchen ADA compliant and air conditioning and that kind of stuff there. Well, so, yeah. <laughs> do, do we need to do any kind of vote amongst us to start talking to them more formally about talking options? To talking, to talking to the Most Holy Redeemer about oh. Oh, I think there. I think they're on board with it. I don't think yeah. we need to do anything formally. I I don't want to do anything formally until I get a vote from the planning board that we can move ahead with these projects. As soon as they have a yes vote on all of this, we can we can we can, we can um, that could have been it right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I don't think so. I think it was you know bad vote. Um, I, I think that that's what we, as soon as we get that, we can just go forward and, and, and do that. I think you don't have to, we know we can do it, it's just a matter of time and the timing and it's so important to know that we can get started on it. As soon as we know that, we can move forward and it's not going to take that much to wrap it up. Can, can we lay out, I mean, I think it might be helpful for, for everybody to, under, to understand to the extent the extent we think we understand. This is clearly a numbers issue. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want anybody to think that we're not all thinking about cost, the total cost of all of this to the taxpayers. Um, so what we know right now, again, is we have the grant money for the library, it's millions of dollars, no, no brainer, everybody understands that, that we clearly wouldn't want to lose that money. We also know um, what the cost of the estimated cost of the senior center is right now. And some of what was being proposed is that, and just in the absence of anything else happening, the longer we go on, the original plan was that we were going to do this in a linear fashion, that the senior center would be built, the Hooker School would come down, the library construction would start. Um, and that all worked out very well from a timeline standpoint. As we've hit the delays with the site approval process, um, the longer we go, the more costs are being incurred, not only because of escalation costs, which, I mean, and, and unfortunately the economy is not doing us a favor right now because the timing is such that with tariffs and a lot of other things going on in the uh, the economic sector right now, the cost of construction is escalating at a pretty rapid pace. So, I mean, it's just kind of a perfect storm for us to have these delays. But, so, so we're very conscious of that. Um, that had already started a conversation about maybe we ought to look at a parallel track of some kind, like maybe we don't have the luxury of finishing one, tearing it down, starting the other. Maybe we need to start 
looking at these um, projects in some sort of parallel fashion so that both might have a period of time where construction is going on in both places. It's not ideal, but the intent of that was to try to, again, preserve some of the escalation costs down the road. What is being proposed by at least a couple of the planning board members that came up last night, as Joyce mentioned, is the possibility of the town purchasing additional land. That land um, is on the market, but it's extremely expensive. Um, so we're talking $5 million. Millions of dollars that the town would have to incur. Mm -hmm. And then it would also be the cost of moving the site of the senior center, because that really is the intent of purchasing that much land. That, that, again, this is just what was being discussed openly last night. Um, so we would go from a seven point whatever million dollar senior center um, to you know potentially a 12 million dollar senior center it, that scenario it's a land purchase design cost right i mean hundreds of thousands of dollars because it has to be a complete redesign you don't just pick up what you have and plop it on another plot of land all of the drainage everything has Death to be boring everything, everything has to be redone over, yeah. um, the parking everything and then, in order to accomplish that, you need time. And time is going to introduce escalation charges. So again, I, I just want to be clear, and I'll only speak for myself at this point. You know, there have been some suggestions that, that the select board's ignoring some of this, and that there's an obvious solution that we're not taking into account. It's my personal opinion that that is not in the best interest of the taxpayers right now, nor is it what the taxpayers asked for. So that's why I'm not jumping on that bandwagon, and I, I suspect you guys feel the same way. I mean, that's an awful lot of money when really all we were arguing about when we went into the meeting last night was 12 parking spaces. Yep. Do, so, we, do, we, do we know or could we find out whether, and I'm sure the answer is no, whether the uh, owners of, those prop of the property would be willing to sell a piece of the land enough to give us another 20 feet parking spots. Yeah, what we what we do know is that when we originally, we put an RFP out a couple of years ago now, mm -hmm. 2016. And when that RFP went out, um, there was, it actually kind of went out twice. So there was an initial response and it didn't meet the criteria for a valid response to an RFP. Um, then. Then we went out again and we had to clean up some of the language in the RFP and one of the select board members at the time went over to have a discussion about just that, that very thing. Um, and he did discuss it directly face to face with one of the landowners who said absolutely not. Now, you know, we're not willing to sell just a portion of the property. If that's changed, we're not aware of it, but we certainly, you know, based on everything that I've heard, I have no reason to think that that would be the case right now because otherwise it would already have happened. And we do have, I almost wanted to run down there last night, except that we have uh, a signed agreement from the Legion. Um, I did have that in my hand last night, uh, except that the select board had not had a, an opportunity to, in open session, to vote on it and to sign it. We, we all agree with it, and that was that's on our, our <coughs> list of things to do tonight, but we do have a signed agreement from the Legion. So that that is in process. Um, yes. Does that um, agreement state that the senior center will build, be built there? Um, we haven't discussed that in executive session. I mean, because if it, if the senior center isn't built there, then why have the agreement? It's, it, the, it'll be the, fine. The yeah. agreement is, I can, I can say this part because we've already read it. The agreement is, is that the agreement is valid when the senior center is constructed. On that site. On that On site. That site. Yeah. So they've agreed to it. We've come to a very good conclusion with them. We're trying to be, and they're trying to be good members of this and, and contribute to the community also. They've always been supportive of us and we are been of them. So, you know, it was nice that we did come to a, an agreement. It seems to me if, that, if that's true, that's, you know, and it wasn't. That was one of the things that was one of the things that was, I wasn't said explicitly, I think, last night, but it's been there. Mm -hmm. 
that's one thing that some of the members feel it has to be resolved. So if that's resolved, that's one thing. If the parking is resolved one way or the other, either with ZBA or going to town meeting and, and changing the bylaw so that it, we can be complying with it, with a reasonable, and again, we're not trying to say get out of jail free card, we're not asking for that. We're asking for some reasonable regulation. Um, and we can redefine what that is, because it's not well defined in the bylaw now. And um, that's why we're, I think we're looking at parallel tracks, is yeah. because I don't think it's still losing time. Right. We're still losing time. <laughs> but we still have to get it to a yes. Right. right. So. And what if it never goes to a yes? Because I don't see ever placating those two members of the board. Well, we have other options to explore as a. Well, so that's up for re election, I think. Yeah, that's a real time fault. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you, I mean, it's, it's a lot harder for them to. Again, if that's the same, here's this, here's this, here's this. We have done you asked for it, we gave it to you. Multiple times. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree Simple with David. I, I, think, I think right now, I mean, what I'd like to see, and I think what the people in town are expecting is, I think people are, are exhausted and they're looking for some movement. Um, I think if we can move forward with really nailing down the plans one way or the other for kind of the, the swing space or whatever we want to call it, that period of time. We can, we can start working on that immediately if the board decides to do that tonight. We have the town meeting coming up on October 18th. So on October 18th, um, we're going to be discussing a couple of um, warrant articles that could address the, some of the planning board concerns. Now, mind you, that language has to be crafted, the planning board is going to have an opinion on that, you know. But I mean, it, we could we could move to change the bylaws that are currently problematic for them right now. And if that were to change at town meeting, then again, theoretically, we would get the clearance for the senior center on that site at that point. Tim, can we have town council look at the the issue is making these modifications to the zoning bylaws? which I think a lot of people are in favor of and I'd like to see it go a little bit further with the parking because it is detrimental to a lot of um, businesses but in the past as we did once before with the accessory apartment we could not get that to town meeting floor even if we did and get a favorable vote if the planning board does not have a hearing on it and does not discuss it or get a vote on it, it's null and dead no matter what the vote is at town meeting for. So, you know, we're talking about modifying the bylaw, but our hands might still be tied on this. Which goes back to what David said. I mean, that, here's the way I'm looking at it. I know there are a lot of things that have occurred that have not warmed the cockles of my heart as a resident in terms of what has been said and some of the, the behavior around these projects, right? But the planning board is an elected body. They exist, they're part of our government. They provide a critical role, and it's not just us. I mean, we have a lot of people rolling through the planning board. We have people going to them all the time looking for, you know, um, additions to their homes or, or you know, commercial projects, all of that. And I I just want to be careful that we don't we don't go so far that we destroy that relationship to the point that the only thing we can hope for is upcoming elections that are gonna happen in serial fashion over a multi year period of time. I mean we should try to work with them based on how they're working and their charge is to interpret and uphold <coughs> these bylaws that exist. So it just seems like the right thing to do is to try to work with them to change that, um, you know, come up with a municipal exemption, so to speak, uh, around the parking issue that would get us through this point in time. So can I ask the library and senior center people that are here, who would, obviously it's not ideal in, in not progressing the way that we were planning originally, but we've already had a ton of delays. So 
is that something that you would support is at least moving forward with a portion of the project that we can obviously the senior center is going to have to you know use temporary space it's going to be a hardship on, on you and your programming so is that something that you would support or is it uh, at least to accomplish part of the goal and you know I don't think that I would be adverse to um, progress and and it sounds as though what most holy redeemer has to offer although this is the first time hearing about it and i'd like to know more um you, you know what i know <laughs> <laughs> okay the whole thing right there. Um, i guess you know i mean just hearing this now and all the rest of that um my my sticking point is that we're still at an impasse and i i'd like Although I'm not adverse to keeping the town moving forward, I'd really like to hear more and go and look and have a conversation with them and all the rest of that. But I'd also like to keep moving forward with getting that approval right. however we need to and move and mo continuing to move. I don't want. You know, it, to be in there open-ended and not be really looking for an end point to start because well you're not going you're not going to move over there unless we have a vote from the planning board so I mean we can get things settled in action and this is our alternative swing space for the senior center if that's what we need to do for the time being until we can put a you know pitchfork in the ground and and start the uh, building of the senior center but we have to have something from them but we also have to have a concrete backup plan of what understand. we can do I so understand it's not that we have neglected to tell you about this this is new this right is like no I, I understand that so that you know I don't think you're gonna find another better swing thing no no and I'm and I you know and I'm very appreciative for their offer it sounds like the best possible scenario and I'll agree with can that give you, I think I think all this can give you the assurance and I won't speak for everybody but that we're not abandoning that project by any means the voters have voted numerous times to build project what we're trying to do is avoid incurring additional costs on the library I understand in the meantime. so if, if we can move that that's we're trying to avoid the nuclear option on our, our part is for the project. So. so I just have a question. Um, when you say the swing space, are you're looking at thinking about that swing space after the approval happens for the project. So you're saying we get approval for the project, we procure swing space, and then we move in. Then the seniors move in. So this is still contingent upon getting a full site plan approval? I'm just asking. It is, it is. Even, if, even yeah. if we get a right. library approval, at least it would be, and we've talked about that, that so it would at least. Are you talking about decoupling them and just asking for a library approval? I'm just confused what you're asking for from the two select board. Tracks. Right, from, from the planning board. Tracks. Oh, from we're the planning board, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Again, and again, and maybe attorney Reedy has um, thoughts here but you know <laughs> we have between now and September 13th right to, to try 11, this again 11 11 sorry September that's right 9 11 I'm gonna forget that um, to try this again but we want to start m moving forward it's oh. gonna take a while to deal with and, and interview people and, and obviously the, the next logical thing is uh, the, the parishioners at most holy redeemer right now who are at home going what <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but you know obviously getting Suzanne over there to take a look at it so there's a whole lot of legwork around the swing space right between maybe something will break between now and September 11th but hearing the conversation last night are the seniors planning on coming, or are the building committee planning on coming back with any sort of design concessions? I don't know, I haven't heard that. You know, I'm trying to think of the things that would have to happen in order to get those right. votes mm -hmm. switched, or at least one of those votes changed. So, to me, swing space is a parallel thing that needs to happen along with, right. and it, the earliest, along with are we decoupling, and if we decouple the library and the senior center, we still can't, Get, I mean, how would we get the library part approved by the 
planning board without that other portion in it. Remember, they wouldn't approve right. 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 the senior center without the library in it. Well, so they made would, the comment last night. Yeah, but that's, yeah, they've done all that comments well, and I then. Yeah. Me, but I it know. is still one site. I mean, unless they're right. talking about, you know, uh, changing the deed so that it's two separate sites, it is one site. But it's, yeah. a, new, it's a new conversation, right? right? So once we get through September 11th, if that doesn't go the way that we want it to, then clearly we're going to be going back to them and saying, okay. What is it going to take? What if we did this? What if we did that? What if we did that? But we have to get it figured out. And they, they need to play a role in that and be at the table for that. And I think that they would be. So may I, may I ask a quick question again? Um, you emphasize the important role that a responsible planning board has in the town. Individuals and businesses go to them to get projects done. And they tell the individual or the business what they need to do to have a conforming project. But what I'm just hearing this evening is they have not told us what we need to, okay. to do to have a conforming project. We need 12 more parking spaces. I know I'm playing catch up here. But um, but they haven't defined how to get that done in, in there? How That's they would be happy if we, to get that done? There's, and there's only two members that believe that. Three members are willing to say the site is good as is. And the two members that think we need more parking, is that the problem? Mm -hmm. um, have they suggested That's where the space is going to come from? Yes. Well, buying well, additional buying land. land. Yeah. Yeah. Really? That's yes, their that's their idea. They want us to buy the property mm -hmm. behind. That's and one of them has a professional relationship with the family, right? So is this uncomfortable? Tim has a question. Yes, it is. The senior <laughs> center has no parking per se by the formula, right? It was a light. It was uh, Wait, just asking. We're the sharing question. that yeah. parking. Don't give some of us yeah. for their purpose. Yes. So why why also where did the well, how did we come up with twelve that was? <laughs> it, it, it's I mean honestly, I mean, this is a conversation that's better had with with them in the the room. You know what I mean? So you can go back and you can watch the the meeting and draw your draw your own conclusions. We're just saying this is where we're at. The twelve so. parking spaces came from attorney yeah. Lee. They Tom didn't come from the planning board. That, that was yeah, his suggestion. I'll have to jump in and explain. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's why. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> go, go sit up here. Um, thanks for seat. having me. Yeah, the hot seat for sure. Uh, so, I guess, Tim, to answer your question first, what we're looking to do is to have the senior center comply with the language of the zoning bylaw that two to one, which it does. The library, on the other hand, what we're looking to do is avail ourselves of the Dover Amendment right. 48, Section 3, where we're saying that the parking that we're providing is reasonable for the use. We've got Joe Bard opined, yes. Art Krieger from Anderson Krieger opined, yes. We have said this is reasonable. Um, the planning, two of the planning board members do not believe either that it is an educational use uh, protected by the Dover Amendment or the parking is not reasonable. I'm not exactly sure which it is or if it's both, or if it's neither, and it's something totally different than that. Um, and so what will happen on September 11th, if nothing else changes, is we'll have to go to a vote, and if it's the vote that we may be expecting, it's gonna be three in favor, two against, which under the Hadley Zoning Bylaw, because it's Site Plan Review Special Permit, uh, the special permit requires a supermajority, four-fifths, we'd only have three, and it would be deemed a denial, at which point, once that decision is filed with the town clerk, there's 20 days to appeal. And so when I'm hearing about these parallel tracks that you're thinking about, that's something that this board needs to think about because part of the guidance to me is to push for a vote. Because if you were watching last night, which it sounds like you were, it was more of a, the writing appears on the wall unless there's some last ditch effort that we can do to change that. But I just wanted the select board and the town to, maybe think outside the box, maybe think of anything else that they can to try to help this through. Because I think optically, if there is a denial and an appeal, it would be the town appealing the town. And I don't think that looks good for the town in order, you know, just publicly for that to happen. And there's money involved, there's time involved. Um, I think on the merits, I think that our position uh, is very well healed. I think it would win on the merits, but like everybody knows, there's uncertainty in litigation and also time constraints in litigation. Um, just to talk to the, to the variance pieces of it, and 
yes, while it was suggested that we could go and get a variance, that's, you know, every time there's an action, there's going to be a, a reaction to it. And that reaction might be the planning board or an abutter or somebody else, whether it's them in fact or them as straw for somebody else pushing them to do it. There could be an appeal of that, and then we're back in the morass that we just had described. So really what we're looking to do here, and I think uh, I'm very pleased to hear that you're considering a zoning amendment, because I think that is a fantastic idea to kind of move again in parallel. I guess my comment about, and I'll get to the whole parking spaces in a minute, my, my comment about the coupling is just think about what that does, if anything, but when you do it, if you do it, and what that does to the senior center project, because we heard what you heard, and whether, I don't know um, how sincere uh, the discussion was, and we will approve this or not, but tied together, are they stronger than separate? And I think that's something that the board needs to consider. To get to the to the 12 parking spaces, it was, you know, the, the bylaw is two to one. Um, so what I had the engineer do was to look at what we are proposing. So part Dover Amendment, part bylaw compliant. What's that uh, parking area uh, done in a way that the planning board uses their interpretation? So that came to 44,000 square feet, give or take. Based upon the size of the buildings going strictly two to one, that came to 49,000 square feet. So we're missing 5,000 square feet. But in order to try to extrapolate, because there is no real definition of what a parking space is, TDR says 200 square feet, but that's not the interpretation that the planning board utilizes when they look at um, what's two to one, what's included as parking. So really all I did was looked at the number of parking spaces, and it was 105, figured it's 44,000 square feet yields this. So what, the, what would, in that calculus, 5,000 square feet require, and that's where the 12 parking spaces came. Uh, the chairman said, the way my calculations go, we're looking at more like 16, but still, that seems like the number that we're talking about. I think one of the things to think about is if the uh, board, if we were able to redesign or do something to gain that 5,000 square feet to comply with the letter of the bylaw, would that be enough to get these two members, or yeah, would it just, one. or at least one, one yeah. certainly. Um, would that be enough to get them there, or would it just be something else? And I think that's a, a, a conversation that needs to be had, because it's significant costs in redesign to even get to that point if it's, if the writing's on a wall that it's not gonna be there, then maybe resources are bell, better allocated elsewhere. It, it just seems to be one more thing, one more thing. I've never seen a project like this in the time I've been in this business. Projects that um, are not successful go this route. So the planning board understands that I'm not saying all of them, but just given my experience across the Commonwealth, delay can equal death of a project. And I don't know if that's the goal here, um, and it might not just be delay, but there might always be that additional thing so that we don't ever get to that point unless we're forced to go the route which is an appeal, which again, I think there is merit to it, um, but again, there are other costs, non-financial, that come along with it. My concern is we're gonna have to go back to the uh, taxpayers and ask for several hundred thousand dollars more to make up for the inflationary costs. And more than that. Yeah. A redesign is gonna be the same. Yeah. And the lawsuit's going to be the same. I mean, that we're, we're positioned right now, it's a rock and a hard place. It's a pick your poison. Boy, does Everything some, somebody have a history for lawsuits, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> so, so again, again that's, that's what we're wrestling with. It's not, yeah. it's not an obvious, oh, um, an obvious decision. So, I mean, I, again, I continue to think that, that the best course right now is to try to, try to respond to, to, the issues that were articulated. Nothing we can do but speculate about anything that wasn't articulated. Um, the other thing that came up at the very end of the meeting when the um, abutters were talking to the planning board about the possible sale of the land is they did mention that they they have another interested party. You know, if, if, if that went through, that that could change the mindset too. Um, so, I, and I do think that there's continue to be some moving parts here over the next next few weeks. 
um, you know, and maybe maybe we could talk to um, the chair of the planning board and, and maybe the planning board amongst, you know, he could reach out to the individual members who are no votes to try to nail down what it really would take. Um, I mean, I was done once before and it failed, but we could try it again. Right. And I, I think you're at that point now where if it fails again, then it seems like there has to be a next step just to give some closure to this so you know what's going in the swing space, what's going to happen here, and just what the next steps are. And if we just keep it pending, it's going to continue to be pending. So there does have to be some finality. And we're meeting on the 12th, right? We're scheduled to. Yeah. So we'll be meeting the next night. Yeah. Anything to follow? I know that Jennifer did some work on uh, trailer rentals, and so I don't know if she shared that with you. Or I haven't yet. I have copies for everybody. Um, I made 10 copies. I'm happy to share them. I did a triple wide, a double wide. I broke them into singles and doubles. And uh, we also received an offer for a very large. You saw that? Yeah. I mean, it would be it would be ample. The whole town can move in, but the former <laughs> there's 27 offices. We literally all can move in. Um, but it, it's a it was the former temporary uh, Orleans Police Department while they were rebuilding their new place, and so they have it ready to go. They have a big big space in it where you could where the senior center could have activities, and it would provide space for all of the apartments and then some. But um, I do. It, it, it's very, this is just for budgetary, I did not take it out the bid or anything, um, but to rent two triple wide trailers, you're looking at uh, about $135,000, not including connecting water, sewer, and electricity, um, and the IT concerns. That's for one year rental for two trailers. Um, that would provide ample space working on the formula the, uh, the formula that the trailer companies use based on what needs would be. Um, Zumba, lunches, um, and your programs. Um, and, and I, when I asked them, I told them it would be a senior center and I described the types of activities that would be happening there. Um, so there is, that is a possibility. It is um, a little, it's a, it's a little bit of, it's a lot of money. Um, and also, also uh, the site plan, uh, site preparation. It has to be um, either paved or gra gravel. Um, so there, there's other costs that are not included in the quote that the trailer company provided, but I'm happy to pass these out, and I have lots of copies for everybody. So do we want to, like, maybe have just a couple of people working on this with the municipal you know, building committee or whatever? Uh, I'll tell you, my preference would be, I, I happen to be on the parish finance council. I don't think that I should be negotiating anything with the church. I just don't want any appearance of uh, anything, so. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to help out. I think we should go forward, though, and try to make arrangements just so we have yeah. them ready to go. I mean, I think there's some stuff we can do to town hall, some minor modifications to make more office space and some meeting space. And, uh, you know, we could get some costs together on that and start implementing it so we are ready to go once it happens. Okay. And These just are things we can actually do. So everybody's clear from a timing standpoint, if, if it went this route, the very, very earliest that the library would be ready to do anything with that building, we're looking at the first quarter of next year. So, you know, there there is some amount of time. Things happen slowly around here, so having a good six to nine months lead time is appropriate. But, um, so this isn't anything that we're trying to quickly shove through for October 1st or anything like that. So could you, could I have a clarification about what Tim said about the zoning, about the planning board needing to hold hearings on zoning bylaw changes? Um, what Tim said? Oh. I think Tim referenced 48 section five and the requirement that the planning board needs to hold a hearing prior to any uh, zoning amendments. And it sounded like in another context they didn't, which uh, caused it not to appear on the town meeting warrant. Well, um, it did, it but even though even we we got the favorable vote, it couldn't pass okay. because it didn't go through the appropriate procedure. You, you, need, need, you need them to, and they do it by not having a second, so they don't have the the hearing on it, and it's null and void, and that's a real problem. Is that something? That 
someone could talk to the chair about whether it would be possible to do that and get it to happen. So it still depends on their vote. Is that what you're saying? Yes. But not a four-person vote? Well, I think you need to get something in writing from them yeah. to say if we go forward with some modifications on that that yeah. they will have, they don't have to recommend, but they have to have their hearing. They have to hold a hearing, and they could vote against it. If they can yeah. hold, yeah, they can vote against it, but they have to hold that hearing. Mm -hmm. Which would have to happen by September 18th. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And they're not meeting again until the 11th, so there's no time to advertise it. They are actually meeting, they just don't have all five. Oh. Yeah. I think they're meeting on the, uh, the 4th of September. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, 1st and 3rd Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can discuss it. And again, if it doesn't happen for October, then they can say, well, bring it back to the annual town meeting, we could schedule a special town meeting. And every time all these words spill out of my mouth, I'm going ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching with taxpayer dollars. But we would, I mean, there, that's what we would have to do. What's the, what I'll call the drop dead date for the grant for the library? You know, how, we've extended this for quite some time. Where do we, where do we jeopardize this? So we, I sent the materials to Molly today um, of what our plan looks like now, sort of laid out with the milestones that we have to meet for the MBLC. And the milestone that we're in danger of not meeting is milestone four, which is library open. So based on the estimates of, uh, you know, our construction folks, our architects, um, we really need to have our shovels in the ground by January 2020. It, to give us enough time to meet that requirement. Um, so right now we're still okay, even with these further delays, because I adjust our spreadsheet every single time we have yet another delay. Um, but right now it means yeah. that the library project is on a 44 week hiatus. So does shovels in the ground mean knocking down the location yeah. or mm -hmm. building the new yeah. one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and also means construction in the winter. Shovels in the ground in right. January. Right. Yeah, which is not necessarily very less realistic. than ideal, right? Yeah. yeah. Is it possible for someone to check with the planning board if they would somehow approve the library plan? Without the senior center. Without the senior center, have the vote from town meeting about parking spaces, which would then let them put the senior center back into the plan. Yeah, and then reapply at that point for the senior center. Is that what you're saying? I think it's a continuation still. So have the conversation what do you think about that i mean i think we would just have to from a technical standpoint think about how we approach that decoupling so-called um just to make sure that the board legally is able to separate them vote on one and continue that other piece instead of it being two new applications which in order to do that you're talking about more delays public notice etc if there's a way, and again, I think um, after this meeting, people should think about what does it do to actually decouple. I think there are benefits to it. There are also probably some burdens to it. Uh, but then we can figure out from a technical standpoint exactly how it can be done. And if it can't be done. We have to be careful, though, not leaving the senior center landlocked. Absolutely. Right. 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 Yeah. And that, that's, that's why subdividing the property wouldn't yeah. give it any yeah. frontage on the right. public way. And yeah. got mm -hmm. some issues there. Although there are some other possible things in the works for down the line, but can't go into that. <laughs> Do, so there may be some more space there eventually for some parking spaces, but uh, yeah. Yeah. we're just trying yeah, to do it now. Yeah, we're just trying to get rolling on at least one at this point. So. And at the end of their meeting last night, I couldn't quite hear what they were saying, but were they only referencing town meeting and trying to buy the a joint adjacent land or were they referencing anything else about they asked they were going to send you a motion that they there was that but then there, yeah, i thought there was some anything. other info right. like they were discussing too i didn't have to know it had to do with a bylaw change or anything along those lines no no, no. no i, no, I stayed to the that. very end yeah. the seniors didn't stay the at the very end they made an official motion that yeah. they were going to send you today two motions they one was them. one was considering 
the right. entire piece of one was just the rear. Yeah, so okay. it's not, I don't even consider it because I haven't got nothing. I'm just saying what yes, they said. I know what they said. I didn't know if they were still filming or not. That they was because yeah, everyone were, laughed. Yeah, at I saw him. that part. Yeah. So we didn't get anything. Um, all right, so we'll let's just move so on with our thoughts and yep. see what we can do. Yep. So okay. we'll be in touch with everybody. On the church? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to take be the point of contact for, um, I'll get you in touch with Father Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just, one thing, Father, yeah. this one's yeah. 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 they, they have it's something quiet, it's not like they're the most difficult because they have trying to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. that means you can't just move away or they're going to have access to the... I have no doubt that Hadley Media will keep us surprised of their needs throughout the process. So every one of the trailers I looked at includes office space for every committee and board that is housed in Hooker School, up to and including the public health nurse, and taking into consideration that Hadley Media doesn't need a small 12 by 12 office, they're going to need a couple of 12 by 12 offices, and also, um, and also additional uh, trailer uh i think they said they're 20 by 8 like pods that for additional storage um so that that was all in the when i when i pressed everything out i made sure that there was ample office space and open space for everything that needed to happen everything at hooker schools will be done in these trailers um, I also wondered if we should have a separate group that gets together and everyone is represented in discussing what decoupling would actually look like so that we don't wind up with someone upset or unclear what that so actually looks like. We have to make like. sure that it's legal first. Right. Yeah. So that's, right, that's what I'm saying, a so group that's, that's doing first. that. Yeah. And so that, who's that's, doing that is the question. Well, it would make sense to me it would be the joint committee that would be doing that. Have a group so the group that we've been meeting, yeah. um, call a group of that meeting, right? And, and then that. Okay, I will do that. Sure that we pulled in everybody else's. Name. Right. That's. Yep. I want to make sure that everyone is included and it's done yes. legally. Yes. And yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well then, so we just done. that goes into the Warren articles. We should talk about. Yeah, we've done everything else, so we can do uh, Warren articles. I don't think we're going to get to your town report. We've had enough tonight. <laughs> so so come out and vote on September 4th. Yep, September 4th, you've got your uh, so, primaries. So I think there are two, two more, more articles that we may want to add. One of them is the one that we were just discussing. There's not a placeholder for a bylaw change relative to the parking. Um, we don't have we need to work on the language, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then uh, Alan uh, Weinberg is here to talk about the other item that has come up very recently. What's that? It's, a, it's an opportunity for land acquisition. Oh, yeah. Um, some of you may have heard about it. Molly and I independently found out that uh, the owner of a piece of property that's quite unique in town in terms of uh, providing access to the Connecticut River is putting it on the market and also is willing to offer it to the town. And uh, uh, so we thought, um, because it's these kinds of things, time can be of the essence. Um, and, you know, maybe CPAC, CPAC money or some other money if it's you know, there for this purpose, you might want to at least consider whether this might be something we want to pursue or not. The property is um, on uh, Applebee Road, actually Sandy Beach, which I'm sure everybody's heard of. It's a 10 acre parcel. Um, it historically has been uh, used as a uh, passive recreation by people in town for years, not quite as much recently. Um, it's a beautiful piece of property and it's I actually have some photos if you want to take a look at the pictures. But it's a unique piece of property. And um, uh, with, it, with access from the road, open to the Connecticut River, very easy to pull a kayak in and just sit and enjoy the space. And um, so we wanted to, we did, we did meet with the, um, and I did meet with um, the Community Preservation Committee 
and we're planning, I think, meeting with the Conservation Commission and the Parks and Rec people just to give, let them know what's in the works, whether this goes forward or not, and when, but there may be an opportunity. And I think that we did hear that the town might have first refusal on this because it's 61A. So, um, it, you know, if that comes to pass, if that's the route we go, we should at least be ready to and have our ducks lined up and decide if we want to do this. So it's, uh, not, just, it's not just Sandy Beach, you're talking about a piece of the corn property? Yes, it's the 10 acres includes, um, and actually, can I just throw I, I know which, I know yeah, what your property is, yeah, and I know, I know indirectly you're related to the seller. Uh, by marriage. Yes. Yeah, and I'm not representing <laughs> them today, and I want to get to that. I do know that. that. <laughs> When I heard it, I said, wow, you know, uh, wouldn't that be nice to have, that, have the town people, yeah. not just whoever owns it, uh, and their family uh, use it. Could uh, that be purchased fully with CPA funds, or would it require? Uh, that's a good yeah. question. Well, and, and just to let you know, um, the only reason Alan and I went on Monday night was we weren't sure when they were meeting again. So we, it was really up to the select board to decide whether right. or not you even want to obtain this. Um, we kind of got a little ahead of ourselves, of course, but with, like, just because you know, of the timing, the yeah. Timing. Um, yeah. But you know, at least one of one of the members had an awful lot of awful lot of questions. Um, but I think generally they felt that yes, um, it was a possibility. But um, I think David's also done some research, and there may be other ways that may actually be more attractive to, to fund it if you want to. Yeah, so I went to Janice Stone, the, the conservation agent, and we reviewed the uh, possibility of using various land preservation monies that are, that are set aside, some of which need town meeting appropriations, some of which do not. Uh, so we looked at we looked at balances and the, the property. So I think that there's some additional monies if, if CPAC, which I think is the first place you should go. Uh, if CPAC needs a match, uh, I think there are funds that are available for that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'd like to make a motion to reopen the article, the warrant, uh, to add this as a, at least a placeholder on there. And the other one too? Uh, yeah, and the, the other one for the um, parking. Parking. Yep. By lunch. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? No. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Just I'd like to make and just for the clarification, the motion included closing the board. To I'm yes. just, well, I'm just going to make a motion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, well, we know this by now. We've been around a while. So I'd like to make a motion that we close the warrant. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So good. Okay, so more so, more legwork to come yeah, on that one. I mean, just, you know, I'm, I'm not kind of like, I'm, I feel like I'm. I'm not representing the cemetery committee, which I'm on. I'm not doing the library work. I'm, and, um, you know, I'm just an inst oh. interested person. Sure. I do have a connection, but uh, you know, I will be happy to do you know whatever late work you want me to do. Okay. Or, or Thanks. I mean, I think really that the main thing is fully vetting all of the um, yeah. the funding opportunities, and then David will make a recommendation. Various people who have an interest, like the Parks and Rec and the Con Con up to speed on what exactly is to be talking about here. Well, it would have to come before us to release it anyway if it's in 61A. Right. So that's right. another thing. That we, don't know that, that. we don't know where that all stands either. You know, that's what I'm saying. I think yeah. a lot of the work is, is really, David's has to lay out exactly all of the steps that need oh, okay. to happen so that we could know. Okay. Yep. So I'll, I'll talk to you. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alan. So before we get into the rest of the town warrant, could I um, entertain a motion to uh, have had us sign the MOU for the Legion? Uh, Executive No, it's not a yeah. second. Oh, don't So we'll make a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding with the uh, American Legion Post. Oh, oh I'll second. Okay, it's just it's listed in our executive session. Oh. That's why we're Well, confused. we were going to, if we needed to, it was a placeholder. Oh, okay. So, All right. So, uh, yeah, I need to go into any further detail. No. Just, okay. So, make a motion to approve the MOU with the American any, agent. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 I don't know where John is tonight. He didn't know he wasn't coming. Is he on vacation? He came back Tuesday. Oh. Maybe stayed. Okay, so 
go over the other parts of the town meeting warrant uh, quickly? Yes? No? Yeah, so uh, a, lot of, a lot has changed in the last week. The numbers are... This is just a draft also? Yeah, it's still a work in progress. I'll tighten those up in the next, uh, next uh, couple of days. Uh, but in general, I've taken out a couple of articles that we're not going to move forward with the planning board. This is MS4 water, MS4 stormwater uh, zoning article. It's simply not ready for this. Uh, last night, the planning board decided that they're going to recommend that we extend the moratorium on the adult use marijuana uh, to June 1st, 2019. And they'll uh, work on both the MS4 and uh, the adult use marijuana bylaws for the annual town meeting. Other than that, the warrant is the same as before, adjusting the budget, revolving funds, um, fund balances, where right, to take uh, unproductive money and return them to the fund. The capital stabilization capital is meeting next Monday. Uh, yeah. We have several CPA uh, placeholders, uh, cemetery, uh, cemetery Commission bylaw amendment to clarify uh, what's different with the DPW. Snow and ice sidewalk bylaw amendment. This is something that I know is going to engender debate among the select board. And we should hold off until we have everybody here. Uh, but we did, Marlo and I did work collaboratively on the snow and ice uh, bylaw uh, for sidewalks uh, in order to make it more readable and more enforceable. Well, we had, why this came up was that the, uh, we had talked to Marlo about it. There had been a bylaw before, but it was not really clear on uh, what it was used for. And since the, um, DOT has put in sidewalks all along Route 9, uh, it certainly does widen the amount of work that the DPW has to do in clearing sidewalks. So um, this is for people to be responsible for the sidewalks um, in front of their house, and we may have to uh, adjust that um, bylaw for yeah, so Middle Street and West Street, which are um, have always been, well, been taken care of by. Yeah, but this would cover both state layouts as well as, uh, as uh, town So commercial uh, properties along Route 9 would be responsible for clearing exactly. the sidewalk? Exactly, because that's an unfunded mandate that the, right. uh, the state imposes. That mm -hmm. They're happy enough to build the sidewalk for free, but they will not maintain it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's typical in most of the cities and towns around the country anyways, is that yeah. they're responsible for your own sidewalks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out of respect for John Wiskevitz, he had a big issue with it, so We'll wait on that yeah. mm -hmm. for the discussion. Just wanted to know where it came from for you. It was because of the other sidewalks that had been put in on Route 9. So with Marlowe's resignation and with some of the changes in the CPAC uh, funding uh, requests uh, uh, and with the final budget from the state uh, being different from what we thought, I'm going to tighten up as much as I can and we'll have some real numbers for you next time. Anything else anybody has on the town meeting warrant? On the, uh, just on the adult use marijuana, we can't say, rather have that be in for this meeting? Well, I, I would prefer that it is. And I talked to the planning board last night that I'm worried about a work management uh, uh, for them, because MS4 is going to be big and complex. The substantial penalties if we don't have that in place by uh, the beginning of the next fiscal year. Uh, if they defer the adult use marijuana, which I think is relatively straightforward, They're, they have, do have a model. That model, I know, doesn't cover cultivation, yeah. so that's something they need to tighten up. I was thinking that that model seemed pretty good, and if you wanted to change things, we could always do that at the normal town meeting. So I encourage them to yeah. work on it uh, in the next couple of weeks. I know that the Board of Health yesterday approved the final language on the uh, Board of Health regulations, and they'll be moving that to the hearing on September 18th. Mm -hmm. 
So if they do go ahead with the adult marijuana use uh, zoning regulations, would we need to make sure that our uh, vote we took to limit the number of licenses is on there? Because I thought that needed to be voted on separately then. Right. So there's Board of Health regulations, which do not require a town meeting vote. And so the limit of the licenses wouldn't be found there. But it would be with the so adult use zoning law by law. My concern is that going to the town meeting and asking for an extension of the moratorium, what if you get a no vote there? Yeah. So what I'm saying is, is there a way to put just the limit on the licenses on there at least in the meantime if we're not going to go for a moratorium or if we're not going to... It seems like we're leaving it open. We're, we're putting it at risk where we're going to open the floodgates. So you are. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's why I asked him. One of the reasons why I asked him to continue working on it rather than just go for an automatic extension on that. But to David's point, if the planning board says there's no way that we're going to be in a position to present something, can we use that placeholder to at least put the limitation in there? On the two licenses that we have? I don't, I don't know the legal answer to that. Functionally, yes, it would be easy to do. Okay. Um, but whether it would have any bite or not, I don't know. I thought the limitation was in the bylaw. It's part right, of the bylaw. Right, it would be a zoning bylaw. And so yeah. we go back to the things that we talked about. If they don't hold a public hearing, mm. uh, if they don't make a recommendation on coming in Florida, then there's no approval by the Attorney General on the other end of it. But I, I thought there was our vote, our recommendation on the number of licenses was separate from the actual zoning bylaw. Right, that it, would be, it would have to be incorporated. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Anything else? Any announcements? Put them to work. <laughs> yeah. I got one just from the collector's office. A reminder. <laughs> Hold on. I'll find it. Water and sewer bills, September 4th, uh, due to the Labor Day holiday. That's the due date, September mm -hmm. 4th. Okay. A reprieve. That's right. A reprieve of three days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come in, pay your bill, vote. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. So vote, September 4th. Pay your water bill. Pay your water bill. Sounds like a plan. Uh, any anybody else? I have a couple. Um, just to re we received a letter from um, Eugene Palmer. Uh, he's a major United States Army retired, and he wrote this letter is to formally commend the efforts of Mr. Drew Hutchinson, the town of Hadley media director. During the past six months, he has professionally guided my production of a film for the Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, of which I am a volunteer. Mr. Hutchinson's technical expertise and teaching abilities are exceptional. He is patient, enthusiastic, and completely passionate about his job. He encourages his understudies while giving expert technical, organizational, and artistic advice. He has a tremendous work ethic, is friendly, and always goes the extra distance to help someone out. I am very pleased that our town has acquired a person of such tremendous qualities and capabilities. Thank you for your attention to my letter, and please pass it on to his direct line of supervisors. Very nice. Well done. Good job, Drew. Thank you. Yeah. And I have some announcements on passings. Uh, one to uh, Lawrence, uh, the family of Lawrence LaPrade, who is Bob LaPrade's father and Molly's father-in-law. Um, so sorry for his passing. We send our condolences yeah. to Bob and your family. Thank you. Um, to the family of Robert Healy and to the family of Jack Busco, uh, graduate of, he's been a local businessman here in town and um, passed away recently. And so our condolences to their families. And then Mary Blyda passed away. So condolence to the Blyda family on Mary's passing. She was the uh, choir director for a number of years at uh, Holy Redeemer. Um, it's Holy Rosary now. Oh, all the way around. Boy, it's, it's late, boy. Uh, anyway, the other way around. But Mary always enjoyed singing. And uh, so condolences to her family. And entertain a, our next meeting will be September 5th. September 5th. And 7 o'clock? Uh, we usually have it at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. 
after we do the warrant, we got to act like we got All right, can we make it for six? Someone better remind me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send out a reminder. We have an um, ambulance oversight committee, but I, we may have scheduled it for 5 o'clock anyway, so I'll just make sure that that gets yeah. wrapped around it. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Is it the fifth? Could we get some copies of that MOU so that we could give some to the Legion? Absolutely. And then everybody here would get a copy of it also? Absolutely. I think it's all signed, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Motion okay. to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you very much.